We welcome you this evening to tonight's debate. You're going to hear a little bit more about that or a lot more about that from our friend and colleague, uh, Chris Arnzen. I'd like to introduce Chris right now. Chris then will introduce the debaters, tell us more about that, and also then moderate the debate as well. Chris Arnzen is no stranger to most of you. And before I introduce him, uh, I wanted to remind you again that he is featuring a, a pastor's luncheon on Thursday, October the 5th. Some of you have seen his, uh, his uh, flyer on this from the back table there, the corner table. And as a special offering, um, this is not just for pastors. If you're here, um, any men, any, any gentlemen who are here, you are welcome to come to that um, gathering uh, at no cost and free lunch. Now, and free what else? Free books. Oh, yeah, t tons of free books. And um, when there's free lunch, though, you might, you, you might want to get towards the front of the line. There's um, nothing, nothing faster. Well, the only thing faster than uh, a pastor in the buffet line is a cop to the donut line. But the pastors just love those free lunches, no doubt about it. But you are welcome if you're a pastor or if you are here as a gentleman on Thursday, October the 5th. More information on the table and make sure you take an extra flyer or two to hand out to someone else. Chris Arnzen, a veteran of radio, having decades of experience employed in that field since the mid-1980s. He was the Long Island account ex executive for WMCA, 570 AM, and others in New York. These are affiliates of Salem Media. If you know much about Christian radio, you probably know about Salem Media for sure. It's the largest Christian radio network in the world. He was employed by them for 15 years, and while there, Chris created a nightly program titled The Voice of Sovereign Grace, which was hosted by five different theological reform ministry leaders every week, including R.J. Rushdooney. That show remained on the radio for, on the air for about a decade, about 10 years. In 2005, Chris launched his own daily radio talk show, Iron Sharpens Iron. It was originally out of WNYG 1440 AM from a place called Babylon, Long Island. Raise your hand if you'd like to be from Babylon. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but that's where Chris was, and that's where he hosted the radio from, uh, the, the radio program from, that place. After re relocating to Carlisle, PA, uh, thankfully for that, that's a blessing to us, Carlisle not far from here, in 2015, Chris relaunched Iron Sharpens Iron, where it con continues to be heard globally at www.ironsharpensironradio.com via live streaming. How many of you have, I just want to ask, show of hands, how many of you have heard either live or recorded an Iron Sharpens Iron radio program? Wow, thank you. Looks like at least half, maybe more. Wonderful. Over the years, Chris has interviewed and has received glowing written commendations from many of the most highly respected and globally renowned Christian leaders, many of them including, of course, Dr. James R. White. We're thrilled that you're here with us tonight. I think you're in for an absolute treat. As we mentioned before, Chris has, ho has already hosted and moderated multiple debates. So this is definitely not his first rodeo, and we're hoping not his last. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chris Arnzen. Thank you. I'm so glad that so many of you raised your hands when Joel asked how many people have heard of my show. I was starting to get heart palpitations, knowing that I was going to be humiliated uh, just by maybe one or two hands, but uh, I was actually pleasantly shocked that so many of you have heard of the show. My name's Chris Arnzen, as you just heard, host of Iron Sharpens Iron Radio, and I hope that those of you who haven't begun listening to my program will begin very soon at ironsharpensironradio.com, Monday through Friday, 4 to 6 p.m. 
but I promise you I will not take advantage of my position as moderator to advertise my show. That would be too crass. And at ironsharpensironradio.com, we don't believe in that kind of thing. <laughs> ironsharpensironradio.com stands for integrity and honesty and gospel-centered programming. Uh, today we have a debate and uh, we have two very qualified candidates who are taking the respective sides of this very important issue. Is gay Christian a biblically acceptable identity for a member of Christ's church? And answering that question with a yes is Dr. Gregory Coles, who is uh, on my left. And I hope that you will give uh, Dr. Coles a very warm welcome, no matter how opposed you may be to his position, because uh, he is a, a rare breed of person that has the interest in public debate and the courage to publicly uh, stand firm for what he believes and wants to defend it, because believe me, especially with topics that are in opposition to the traditional evangelical view, especially on this, this very topic today and those topics that are similar, it's very difficult to find anybody that will publicly defend their view in a debate. And I just thank God that providentially after trying uh, and, and inviting many people who were considered experts in their field to defend either the thesis today or something similar, uh, just was riddled with rejection and some uh, polite and some very not polite or impolite. And uh, somebody recommended when I was nearly ready to give up that I invite Dr. Gregory Coles and he immediately accepted. So I'm very thankful for that. He's the author of Single Gay Christian, A Personal Journey of Faith and Sexual Identity, and No Longer Strangers, Finding Belonging in a World of Alienation. He holds a PhD in English from Penn State and works as a writer, speaker, and worship leader. His fiction and expository writing have been published by Penguin Random House and Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. His academic research on rhetorical theory how Language Works in Society, has appeared in College English and Rhetorica and an edited collection from Cambridge University Press. You can find most of his creative activities curated at gregorycoles.com. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Dr. Gregory Coles. <laughs> to my right, is a very dear friend since uh, 1996, Dr. James R. White of Alpha and Omega Ministries. He's the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, and he is professor of church history and apologetics at Grace Bible Theological Seminary in Conway, Arkansas, and has various topics in the field of apologetics for numerous other schools. He has authored or contributed to more than 24 books, including The King James Only Controversy, The Forgotten Trinity, The Potter's Freedom, The God Who Justifies, and The Same-Sex Controversy, defending and clarifying the Bible's message about homosexuality. He is an accomplished debater, having engaged in more than 180 moderated debates, public debates with leading proponents of Roman Catholicism, Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Mormonism, as well as critics such as Bart Ehrman, John Dominic Crossan, Marcus Borg, and John Shelby Spong. Before travel restrictions, James debated in such locations as London, Sydney, as well as in mosques in Toronto and South Africa. He is a pastor and elder of Apologia Church in Arizona. He has been married to Kelly for more than 40 years and has two children and five living grandchildren. And ladies and gentlemen, to my right is Dr. James R. White of Alpha Megman. As far as the format of the debate goes, each of the debaters, starting with Dr. Coles, will give a 20-minute opening remark. And then, following that, there will be rebuttals of 10 minutes in length each, first Dr. Coles and then Dr. White. And then the, the best part of the debate, uh, typically uh, those who attend debates, it's their favorite 
part of the debate, and I think the most essential aspect. There will be a first cross-examination session where Dr. White questions Gregory Coles for 15 minutes, and then Dr. Gregory Coles questions James White for 15 minutes. During those sessions, the one being questioned is not to ask his own question, and he is not to uh, give speeches either, or switch subjects. The only question that the one being questioned can ask is a clarification question, like what exactly did you mean by that, or, or something similar. Uh, then, uh, after a break, after those two 15-minute sessions of cross-examination, uh, this time, after we return, Gregory Coles will question James White for 15 minutes, and James White will then question Gregory Coles for 15 minutes. Then there will be final remarks, starting with Gregory Coles and then James White, of five minutes each, and there will be audience questions uh, for 30 minutes taken during the end of the debate, and there will be uh, cards, index cards, I believe, on every table. If you have a question, write it down, because we're not going to have people uh, vocally asking questions from a microphone. That tends to turn into speeches, and we want questions, and we want brief questions. And please, if you really want your question asked, please write it legibly. If you have horrible handwriting, tell someone else to print in block letters your question. I'm serious. I do, I've done this many times, and there are times when I look at the card and I say to myself, how does this person think anybody on the planet Earth can read this other than themselves? So please, write legibly, and if you can't write legibly, ask somebody to do it for you. Uh, but now we are going to start with our opening remarks for 20 minutes, Dr. Gregory Coles. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that Chris said I was an expert at debate, or capable at debate, something like that. I hate to disabuse you of that notion, but I am not. Um, I learned today that this will be Dr. White's 182nd debate, and I've never done a debate before, so this will be fun for me. Um, but thanks for joining me in this adventure. I do believe in the value of thoughtful conversation across difference, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, when I was initially asked to do a debate with Dr. White this weekend, I thought I would need to say no, not because I didn't want to be here, but because the topic of debate that was originally proposed sounded like something that Dr. White and I would actually agree about. See, when it comes to questions about same-sex sexual behavior and Christian obedience, Dr. White are, and I are, as far as I know, on the same page. I believe, as the early chapters of Genesis outline and Jesus reaffirms in Matthew 19, that Christian marriage is meant to be a lifelong covenant between male and female, and that sex belongs exclusively inside that marriage covenant. I believe that the prohibitions of same-sex sexual behavior in Leviticus chapters 18 and 20 still apply to God's people today, and that we see these prohibitions reaffirmed under the new covenant in Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and 1 Timothy chapter 1. In other words, I believe that followers of Jesus are called to abstain from all forms of same-sex sexual behavior and same-sex lust, as well as a whole bunch of uh, forms of opposite sex sexual behavior and opposite sex lust. It would have been delightful, I'm sure, for us to hear Dr. White make these arguments, but then I would have stood up and argued for all the same things, which would have made for a boring debate for the rest of you. Fortunately, the organizers were willing to tweak the topic into something that Dr. White and I do disagree about, and so here I am. I think it's important as we get going then to make sure that we set the terms of the conversation clearly so that we know precisely what it is that we're disagreeing about, and rather more importantly, what it is that we're agreeing about. Our topic is, is gay Christian a biblically acceptable identification for a member of Christ's church? Embedded within this very title, in the phrase biblically acceptable, is another important point of common ground between Dr. White and me. Both of us see scripture as our authority in this conversation. The driving question here is not, what do I want to believe? Or what is my own idiosyncratic conception of Jesus inviting me to believe? But rather, how do I navigate the circumstance in front of me 
in a way that is unflinchingly obedient to Jesus as he is revealed by the text of scripture. The parts of our topic where our disagreement lies are the words gay Christian and identification. But even here, the difference between Dr. White and me may not be quite as stark as you're imagining. I anticipate that Dr. White will make an argument that it's never appropriate for a Christian to describe themselves as gay. And while I disagree with him on that point, I won't therefore be arguing that the label gay Christian is always good or wise or biblical. Instead, my contention this evening would be this, that whether or not it's in line with biblical teaching to identify as a gay Christian depends entirely by what we mean by identification and what we mean by gay. Let's start with identification and its root word identity. On the one hand, identity is sometimes used to mean the most central, defining, or significant thing about a person. Andrew Bunt defines identity as our controlling self-understanding. When Christians use phrases like finding our identity in Christ, this is the kind of identity we have in mind. Because we are in Christ, Christ is the most important thing about us. The controlling self-understanding through which everything else is filtered. If this is what we mean by identity, then Dr. White and I would agree that gay is an inappropriate identity word for a Christian. But identification and identity can also mean something very different. When I present my passport as a piece of identification, it communicates my national identity, the fact that I'm a citizen of the United States. This sense of the words identity and identification connect more directly to the word's Latin root, idem, which means the same. My passport's identification of my national identity says something about my sameness with other US citizens, but it doesn't tell you anything about my controlling self-understanding or the most central aspects of my personhood. Next, let's talk about the word gay. In 21st century English, Gay can refer to sexual behavior or to lust, but its simplest default meaning is an attraction towards the same sex. We see this not only in dictionaries, the Oxford English Dictionary, Merriam-Webster, Google Dictionary, and so on, but also from questions like, can a person be born gay? The question is clearly not asking, can a person be born engaged in same-sex sexual behavior or lust? since these things are physiological, uh, physiological impossibilities for a newborn. Rather, the question is asking, can a person be born with a predisposition towards attraction to the same sex? When I use the word gay this afternoon, I'll be defining that word the way it's most commonly defined by today's English speakers, as a synonym for attracted to the same sex. Certainly, plenty of people who call themselves gay are intending to eventually find a same-sex sexual partner, but I am not, which is why I typically pair the word gay with the word celibate to make it entirely clear that I'm talking about the direction of my attractions, but not about current or future sexual activity or lust. Finally, let's talk about the phrase gay Christian. We've got an adjective, gay, followed by a noun, Christian. Which word is more fundamental to the meaning here? The first or the second, the adjective or the noun? English grammar doesn't actually give us a clear answer to this question. In some cases, the adjective that comes before the noun just gives additional information about the noun without changing its central substance. In other cases, the nature of the noun fundamentally alters the substance of the noun. For example, imagine if I add an adjective in front of the noun cheese. If I add the adjective yellow and say yellow cheese, most of us would agree that the noun is more important than the adjective. The cheesiness of the cheese is more important than its yellowness. Switching the word order doesn't affect our interpretation. There's no meaningful difference between saying yellow cheese and cheese that is yellow. But what if I use a different adjective? Not yellow cheese, but toe cheese. Suddenly, the situation is very different. 
the adjective has fundamentally altered the nature of the noun, and we're no longer talking about the kind of cheese you thought we were talking about. In that case, the adjective has hijacked the noun. Sometimes when we put an adjective in front of the word Christian, the resulting phrase can mean at least two very different things, depending on who's saying it and what they mean by it. To show you what I mean, let's think about the phrase American Christian. I've met two very different kinds of American Christians in my life. One kind are the Christians who happen to be citizens of the United States. Their obedience to Jesus is the most important thing about them, but their national identity as US citizens is also worth having words for and talking about sometimes because it helps them grapple with how their obedience to Jesus might look different as US citizens than it would if they were citizens of Greece or China or Kenya. They filter their Americanness through the more primary lens of their Christianity. But it's also possible to be a very different kind of American Christian. It's possible to filter your Christianity through the lens of your Americanness, to believe the idolatrous lie that America's kingdom is synonymous with God's kingdom, that God wants America to be supreme, to be first, to be wealthy and happy and victorious and comfortable, even if it means the exploitation or devastation of our global neighbors. It's possible to worship a star-spangled Jesus who loves and cares for the United States more than he does for the rest of the world. It's possible to be an American Christian who is no longer recognizably Christian according to the standards of the global and historic church or to the standards of Jesus. There's nothing inherently bad about the phrase American Christian, but the danger, the temptation towards national idolatry exists for so many of us, regardless of whether we ever identify ourselves as American Christians or not. If the topic of our debate today were, is American Christian a biblically acceptable identification for a member of Christ church? I would have trouble giving an unqualified yes, because I've seen how the phrase American Christian can be abused into something that no longer resembles Christianity. When it comes to the phrase gay Christian, then, I find myself similarly troubled. To be clear, I'm not saying that gay Christian and American Christian are perfectly analogous phrases. I'm sure many of you can think of some differences between the two, and frankly, I'll be disappointed if Dr. White doesn't take exception to the comparison. But though the analogy is imperfect, like all analogies are, it illustrates why I find it difficult on a purely grammatical level to know what someone means when they say, gay, Christian. I know some people who seem to filter their Christianity through the lens of being gay, distorting Jesus so that he fits tidily into a controlling self-understanding based in sexual fulfillment. But I also know some people, like myself, who describe ourselves as gay precisely because we want to bring our attractions under the lordship of Jesus. Having words for the ways I typically experience attraction helps me to anticipate when and how sexual temptation is likely to occur, which helps me cultivate God-honoring habits of resisting that temptation. It also reminds me that no part of my experience of attraction is a surprise to God or escapes his sovereign control. As Abraham Kuyper famously says, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. At this point, we come to a kind of fork in our conversational road. For some of you, it might be pretty significant that what I mean by the phrase gay Christian is synonymous with what some people mean when they say Christian who experiences same-sex attraction. If today's debate topic had been, is Christian who experiences same-sex attraction a biblically acceptable identification for a member of Christ church, you might be arguing in the affirmative right alongside me. Absolutely, you might say, there's nothing contradictory or impossible about a person who experiences unchosen attractions to the same sex becoming a follower of Jesus. And there's no guarantee that same-sex sexual temptations will disappear when that person starts following Jesus. 
You might dislike the word gay, but in its barest sense, the idea that a Christian might experience a lifelong struggle against same-sex sexual temptation might make perfect sense to you. For others of you, however, even the phrase Christian who experiences same-sex attraction might seem like a contradiction in terms. You might believe that anybody who truly turns to Jesus will find their capacity for same-sex sexual temptation erased. Or you might believe that the ability to experience sexual temptation towards someone of the same sex is itself a form of indwelling sin that requires repentance. If you're of the camp that believes turning to Jesus will result in an erasure of same-sex sexual temptation, my simple question for you would be, where do you see this promised in the Bible? Some people will turn to the Apostle Paul's beautiful words in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, where after acknowledging the sinfulness of same-sex sexual behavior, Paul says, such were some of you. I love this passage. Not least because it plainly states that the kingdom of heaven includes people who once engaged in same-sex sexual behavior and have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. But there's no promise in this passage that same-sex sexual temptation or attraction will disappear. The Greek words arsenokoitai and malakoi, which the ESV collectively translates men who practice homosexuality in verse 9, are, to the best of our scholarly understanding, Words concerned with sexual behavior, not with sexual temptation or attraction. Besides, verse 9 also lists pornoi, the sexually immoral, as part of that such were some of you category. And though I hope by the grace of God that many of us have the joy of being washed clean from past sins in the realm of sinful sexual behavior or lust, I suspect that relatively few of us have yet been freed from the capacity to ever experience any form of sexual temptation. To take 1 Corinthians 6's such were some of you as proof that Christians shouldn't experience same-sex attraction or that they shouldn't use words to acknowledge that attraction is to misunderstand either the nature of the words arsenokoitai and malakoi or the context of the passage. Regardless of how we approach the question of Christians having the capacity to experience same-sex sexual temptation, we need to be consistent in our approach to opposite-sex sexual temptation as well. In other words, if we hold the view that the capacity to experience same-sex sexual attraction is sinful, since there's no God-honoring outlet for that attraction to be expressed in sexual behavior, then for the sake of consistency, we also need to hold the view that the capacity to experience opposite sex attraction towards people that we are not married to and cannot be married to is also sinful, since there's also no God-honoring outlet for that attraction to be expressed in sexual behavior. I appreciate the way Dr. Tim Keller makes this argument. He says, if I was perfectly sanctified, I would have no ability to even sexually desire a woman other than my spouse. But the fact is, because we're not perfectly sanctified, all heterosexual men who are married have that ability to desire that, and that is illicit. Notice that Dr. Keller calls himself heterosexual here. In fact, in the video from which this quote is taken, he gestures to himself when he says the phrase, all heterosexual men. I would disagree with Dr. Keller about the moral culpability of sexual temptation. I'm inclined to argue on the basis of Hebrews 4.15 and 1 Corinthians 10.13 that since Jesus in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin, and since we're promised that God will provide a way out when we're tempted, that there's no form of temptation, including sexual temptation, that constitutes a morally culpable sin by its mere unchosen existence. Still, despite that point of disagreement between me and Dr. Keller, I appreciate Dr. Keller's recognition that the ground for all of us at the foot of the cross is remarkably level. And I appreciate his willingness to put words around his own experience of sexual attraction, to call himself heterosexual, as he wrestles with the question of what obedience to Jesus should look like. Imagine if today's debate had been titled, Is Heterosexual Christian a Biblically Acceptable Identification for a Member of Christ Church? I wonder how Dr. Keller would have fared. 
I'll end my opening remarks with a brief personal story. When I first started publicly acknowledging my experience of sexual attraction, the fact that I'd been exclusively attracted to the same sex since puberty, and that I held a historic Christian view of marriage and therefore planned to remain celibate, I was a grad student in the English department at Penn State. The majority of my grad school colleagues had heard that it was an impossibility, a contradiction in terms, to be a gay Christian. And since they understood the word gay to mean attracted to the same sex, they thought that meant anyone who was attracted to the same sex must be categorically disqualified from becoming a disciple of Jesus. I found myself asking, what words could I use to tell my story that would be most likely to communicate the truth of the gospel to these friends? I chose to call myself a celibate gay Christian because I wanted my gay friends to know that their attractions to the same sex didn't make them incapable of loving or being loved by God. You may think I made the wrong choice of language, and maybe you're right, but I hope at any rate you can understand at least a bit of why I made the choice I did. Thanks. All right, there you go. Uh, I hate electronic equipment. Anyways, it's great to be with you this afternoon. I want to thank Gregory Coles. Hey, he's getting to visit home again, basically, uh, from Pennsylvania to begin with. And uh, so it's, it's good to get to go back home and drive on two-lane roads uh, amidst corn stalks uh, at 40 miles per hour. And uh, that's just sort of how it is. It's very different in Arizona, and I've driven in Idaho as well. Very, very different there. Is gay Christian a biblically acceptable identity for a member of Christ's church? The question, of course, is going to very much focus upon the rapid development of new language over the past couple of decades. Uh, entirely new vocabulary is now being used to discuss homosexuality, transgenderism, and the entire array of issues raised by the radical sexual revolution in Western culture. The majority of the believing Christian church has been caught absolutely flat-footed by the speed with which these developments have taken place. While tonight's discussion will, of necessity, have to struggle with terminology and language, it must be remembered that the thesis statement I am denying has a clear foundation. The only way to answer whether gay Christian is a biblically acceptable identity for a member of Christ's church is to address this directly and primarily from the pages of Holy Scripture, which defines for us what Christian and Christ's church actually mean. To determine what is biblical and appropriate for a member of Christ's church, we must ask the serious question, does the Bible tell us what God's view of homosexual desire and activity is, even if we make that kind of a specific distinction and in what context we do. Dr. Coles presents what is called generally today, and this is evolving as well, the side B view, that of a committed celibate stance regarding any sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman. But if we use the same hermeneutical principles from which we derive that view of marriage and from which we derive the gender binary, what must we conclude regarding the nature of homosexual attraction? Is it innate? Is it created by God? And hence something to be sanctified, embraced, accepted, maybe even in a sublimated fashion within the fellowship of the church? Our Lord taught us that his people are to live holy lives in obedience to his commands. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that it is not enough to simply avoid a sinful action. We are to avoid the heart attitudes that could even lead to sinful action. So, for example, in Matthew 5, 27 through 28, we have, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, please note that to understand what Jesus is saying, he's not saying there's something wrong with the commandment itself to not commit adultery. 
but he's saying it is not enough to simply avoid the act, but to indulge the thought. He's not saying that Moses was wrong, he's not saying that it wasn't enough, but he is making application. And what we understand this to mean is the nature and object of our desires is under our control. The nature and object of our desires is under our control and Jesus calls us to be obedient to his will in that way as well. There is nothing disordered about a male desiring a female. Male female love and sexual activity is celebrated in scripture, but it is limited to marriage. Even when there are times in scripture that marriage relationship does not live up to the standard that Moses gave, and that certainly took place, especially under the Old Covenant. The reality is the gender binary is a God-created reality. It cannot be escaped, and it is honoring to him to recognize that. And that male-female sexual activity within that concept of the gender binary and what marriage is, is celebrated in Scripture. But homosexual desire is disordered. It is, in the language of the New Testament, para fusen, against nature, in Romans 1, 26. It does not reflect God's creative design on any level. In fact, to be honest, it is properly identified as being narcissistic. Why? For it involves a desire for a mirror image of oneself. It is not life-giving. It is not life-producing. Another of the same kind, desiring that one of the same kind as myself, cannot function as, and the phrase probably well, should be well known to us today from Genesis, Eitzer Konegdo. Eitzer Konegdo, a corresponding helpmate, one who is different from me but the same as me but corresponds to me. That cannot exist between two males or two females, and at least we're only talking about males and females. Uh, once you get 189 different genders going, you, it really, really becomes confusing at that point. Scripture prohibits the act of same-sex sexual intercourse as part of the Mosaic Code that is not only for Israel, but is binding on the nations. When you look at Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20, Chapter 18 is primarily in regards to the reasons why the land is going to spew its inhabitants out because they have been violating in so many basic ways the fundamental creative order that God has placed within mankind. Leviticus 20 then becomes the law for the nation of Israel. Hence, it has a penal uh, code attachment to it in that giving there in the holiness code. And so this is given to us in scripture. We will see that that concept is continued on into the New Testament. There is a consistency to be found in those applications. Now, the apostle Paul drew directly from these two mosaic texts in his use of the compound term arsenikoites, arsenikoites, which he used in two key New Testament passages. If you've got your Bible, feel free to take a look at it. We already heard this text uh, referred to, but we're going to be hearing it a lot more. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be, see, be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, that's arsenikoitai, plural, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Likewise, in a very similar passage, when Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 9, 
But know this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for sexually immoral persons, for homosexuals, plural form of arsenicoitis again, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching according to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Now, if I may just take a moment here in passing, I want to point out quickly that in writing to Timothy, Paul is following the order of the Ten Commandments in this text. He talks about, for example, killing fathers or mothers. Isn't there a commandment about fathers and mothers? Uh, yeah, there is. Isn't there a commandment against murdering? Yes, there is. And then when he says sexually immoral persons and homosexuals, that is an expansion of the sexual element of the Ten Commandments about not committing adultery. And he joins it with the term arsenicoites, which only increases our, our uh, understanding of exactly what that term means. And so we come to the center of my denial of the thesis this evening. Please note again the inspired text in 1 Corinthians 6, and Greg has already made reference to this. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Here is the key. There is hope, and this is, what, this is why I am motivated to engage in this conversation. There is hope for all those who have been marked by all the sins that Paul had previously listed. And please note, these were not just sins of overt action. One of those sins listed was greed, or in some of the older translations, covetousness, pleonectai in the original language. Coveting is an inward disposition. It's a mindset. It's a regular experience of the desire for the things of others. A covetous person is, is someone who can never be thankful enough for the things that God has given them, maybe not thankful at all. That's why Paul identifies it as idolatry, because fundamentally what you're saying is God doesn't have the right to determine what things I can have or what position I can have in this world or any of those types of things. It's, it's a form of idolatry. But covetousness is not an overt action. It may lead to uh, uh, swindling someone. It may lead to thievery but it is itself an attitude of the heart. And Paul says, he lists people as covetous and says, but that may have been your experience then, but something has changed. What's important to recognize that when Paul says such were some of you, he uses the imperfect tense. Now the imperfect tense refers to the ongoing experience of these sins and their results in the past. It wasn't just simply, well, once in a while there was some sexual sin and once in a while there was some greediness and there was some swindling. No, these were the lifestyles and these were the mindsets and these were the sets of desires that the Corinthians had. But then there is a change described, and I think hopefully all of us here gloriously would say, as you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Interestingly enough, these are all placed in the aorist, not in the imperfect, not describing a, a continuous action in the past. That was the old life, but there was a break, and that break was not something that came forth from them. It is something that has happened to them. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Those are the actions of God. That's a description of what a Christian is. A Christian is an individual who has experienced that washing in the blood of Christ, that sanctification, that being set apart by the presence of the Holy Spirit, that being justified, receiving the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so these are placed in the heiress to point to an action 
that changes the continuing experience of those in Corinth who had now been freed from the dominion of these sins. So here is the essence of my denial. The thesis asks if gay Christian is a biblically acceptable identity for a member of Christ's church. And I think Paul's answer is unequivocal. No. If the sin was ongoing in the past, the washing, the sanctifying, and justifying in Christ breaks that dominion and results in a new reality, in a new creation. It would make no more sense to refer to oneself as a covetous Christian as it would a gay Christian, even if one were to say, well, I still experience covetousness, but I simply do not act upon it. Would it be appropriate then, in light of what Paul tells us, that we should identify ourselves as a covetous Christian? Because no matter how hard I try, I just, I cannot experience true thankfulness and contentment, and I have covetousness toward other people's uh, physical abilities and their accomplishments and their physical goods. I just keep experiencing it. And so since I keep experiencing it, then I just need to express to people that I do so and therefore I am a covetous Christian. Covetousness is a desire for that which God has prohibited. A Christian desires to glorify God, and here's the key, and hence cultivates disciplines and desires that reflect God's will, and we derive that knowledge from Scripture. How is it proper to identify oneself based upon a set of desires that flow from our fallen nature and reflect a reality that was broken by washing, sanctification, and justification? Now, the only way around the biblical reality is to replace the radical break posited by Paul with the modern psychological concept of orientation as an innate, unchangeable reality. And that will obviously be something that we need to discuss this evening. Are we viewing this? Does Gregory view his same-sex attraction as innate and unchangeable? But, I would suggest to you that requires abandoning biblical categories to then bring in that kind of external area. Now, let me anticipate an objection. It was not something that Greg mentioned this evening, but uh, it's in his book and it's in um, a lot of the talks that he's done. My position relies heavily upon the fact that arsenokoitai in 1 Corinthians 6 is clearly in reference to homosexuality. Gregory, in his book and in his talks, indicates that while the term probably refers to homosexuality, we really don't know for certain, and that assuming men plus bed equals gay might be no more sound an argument than butter plus fly equals winged dairy product. Did you come up with that by yourself? You did. You did. Well, I, I need to give you full credit for winged dairy product for butterfly. Now, let me very briefly, in the time I have left, respond to that so that we don't have to uh, go back and forth too much on it this evening. And that is, we are not saying that arsenokoites, arsenokoitai in the plural, that it is a simple matter of, well, arsenos, men. Uh, koite, what you do in bed. So as my uh, co-author of the book, Jeff Neal, said years ago when we debated two homosexuals on this subject, he says, the term means that which men do with men in bed, and that ain't eating crackers. So where'd that come from? It came from Leviticus 20.13, where the Apostle Paul uses, he, he knows the Hebrew, obviously, but he's communicating with people who read Koine Greek. And so he's drawing from the Greek Septuagint, and the Greek Septuagint specifically has, in verse 13 of Leviticus 20, arsenos koitain. So koimethe, to sleep with, but then men in bed as you would a woman. And so he has simply taken the very terms that are right there on the surface of the text 
and he has put them together to describe what is very plainly and clearly was always understood by the Jews, was always understood by the Jews in the days of Jesus, hundreds of years before, hundreds of years after. There was never any confusion about this whatsoever. Always understood to be homosexual intercourse between men. And so this is described as something that is an abomination, an abomination, something that is toeva. Now, by the way, toeva has to be defined by its usage. It can be used in reference to breaking dietary laws and breaking covenant with Yahweh, but it's also used of idolaters in the book of Isaiah. When Isaiah says, anyone who chooses these idols is toeva, is an abomination. And homosexuality is the one sin that is identified as toeva. And Ezekiel tells us when he says Sodom and Gomorrah committed that which was toeva and God took them away. Well, how did he take them away? Well, we know exactly how that took place. And so the meaning of arsenikoitai is very, very clear when you allow the background of the Greek Septuagint to stand. And I think the vast majority of conservative Bible scholars would agree with that. So, there's the laying of the foundation. We've got, I, I sense, a fairly large space in between that we're going to have to be building toward before we're going to be able to understand exactly where each person stands on these issues. But I hope you're listening carefully, taking notes, and let's hope this evening that we are able to get to the point of having clear understanding as we discuss this issue. Thank you for your attention. Ten-minute rebuttal segment with Dr. Gregory Cole. Thanks, Dr. White. That was scintillating. This will be fun. Um, I want to clarify something uh, first just about the, the context of uh, my book and what I write there about uh, arsenokoite says arsene plus koite, uh, butterfly, wing dairy product, etc. Um, uh, that is a part of my book where I'm giving voice to one of the, what I consider one of the better uh, arguments in favor of same-sex marriage for Christians. It's not something that I present in the book as an argument that I agree with or find the best reading of the text. Um, and so the context that Dr. White gave us, um, uh, the context of that word being formed um, from uh, the compound of these same two words that appear in the Septuagint translation of in Leviticus 20, they're right side by side. In Leviticus 18, the same two words, arsene and koiti, do both appear, though they're not immediately side by side in the Septuagint phrasing. Um, but I do mention in my book the, the fact that the existence of those Greek words in the Septuagint translation um, makes that uh, the better reading of the text. So I just wanted to provide that context. That comes as a couple pages after the original, so it's possible that in Dr. White's reading. He missed that part of the book. Um, but yes, uh, though I do think there's value in us attending to the textual complexities and acknowledging them, um, which is what I seek to do in that book, I do also agree. Um, and in fact, I very much agree uh, with the definition uh, Dr. White offers of arsenokoites um, uh, as referring specifically to uh, same-sex sexual intercourse. Um, that will become significant momentarily, um, but we'll get back to that. First, I want to make a brief comment, just offering us a couple distinctions that I think will be helpful for us as we continue thinking forward in this conversation. I think it would be helpful uh, for us to um, make some distinction between a general experience of attraction to the same sex, or what is now sometimes called sexual orientation, a specific experience of attraction to the same sex, or what uh, those of us who hold a historic Christian understanding of sexual ethics might understand as an experience of sexual temptation, um, and then sexual lust. Um, so general experience of attraction, specific experience of attraction, and lust. Uh, it seems to me that there, there can be some utility in distinguishing between those three things. Uh, for example, um, as somebody who has noticed in my life that I have a general capacity to experience attraction to the same sex, that doesn't mean that at any given moment I am experiencing same sex attraction. Uh, so for instance, at this moment, I'm in a room with a lot of men, you're all very handsome, congratulations, I'm not experiencing same sex attraction toward any of you. Um, 
Uh, and I think by a similar token, uh, many of the men in this room who have found that their experience is predominantly or exclusively of attractions toward the opposite sex, uh, when you do experience attraction, wouldn't say, oh, at this moment, I am actively experiencing attraction uh, or I'm actively experiencing uh, sexual temptation if attraction is toward someone who is not your wife. Um, but you might say, I have noticed in my lifetime uh, that there's a general pattern if I'm going to experience sexual attraction towards someone that is going to be a person of the opposite sex. Um, and I think there's value in being able to make that acknowledgement precisely because it allows us to make wise choices. Uh, so for instance, if you know that you're predominantly attracted to women as a man and someone says, hey, would you like me to go throw you into a room full of naked women? You might wisely say, no, that's not going to be a good idea for me. Why? Because I've noticed a pattern in my life that when I experience temptation, it occurs in this way. And so, even though I'm not actively experiencing temptation at this moment, I'm going to be thoughtful in how I structure my life and how I make choices precisely so that I can live in obedience to Jesus. Uh, now, uh, Having, having proposed that it's, it's helpful to d distinguish between these categories, um, uh, I, I want to bring us back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 um, because I think Dr. White's commentary there is really intriguing and really telling. Uh, and again, I, I want to point out to you that he just at the end of his talk defined the Greek word arsenokoites as specifically meaning homosexual intercourse. Um, and so I absolutely agree. I mean, about 95% of what he said in his reading of 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, I agree with because I absolutely agree that, as he said, there are clearly people in that community who, are, uh, who have previously been in an ongoing way, in the Greek imperfect verb sense, uh, who have been engaged in same-sex sexual immorality, who have been engaged in arsenokoites, in homosexual intercourse, um, and that is a thing from which they have been washed and sanctified. Um, and I concur with that truth and I celebrate that truth. Um, where I think we've gotten a bit slippery is that Dr. White has then taken that passage and used it as an argument to say, there must therefore have been people who had a general capacity for an experience of same-sex sexual temptation, and that's the thing they have been washed from, that's the thing they have been sanctified from. It concerns me if we take the text of Scripture and try to make it do more than Scripture itself is intending to do. And as we understand the Greek word arsenokoites, it clearly speaks to sexual behavior, not to this general experience of an awareness for a particular kind of capacity. And so I worry that if we misunderstand the passage, if we misunderstand uh, the word arsenokoites, and we therefore use that passage as a way of claiming, as a way of promising to people who experience unchosen attractions to the same sex, saying, you are guaranteed to no longer experience this. God wants to fix you. Uh, God wants to cause this experience to go away. I worry that we're making a promise that is never given in the text, or, uh, text of Scripture itself. Why? Because the thing we are promised in Scripture is that we will be washed from arsenokoites. But we are not promised that we will have removed from us a general capacity from sexual temptation. Finally, uh, I, I want to make this note. Um, one of the first things that made me aware that there was something about my experience of sexual attraction that didn't seem to fit the, the model I had been given was actually not that I was attracted to men. It was that I was not attracted to women. Um, uh, it was that I was growing up in a context where I was being warned a lot like, look, you're going to develop this irresistible urge to look at pictures of naked women, but don't do it. Um, and I discovered that I was remarkably good at not looking at pictures of naked women. Like, I was so good at it that I started to believe that I was like the holiest 12-year-old in the world because people kept telling me, look, there's this thing that's coming. You've got to be braced for it. You're going to experience some really rough temptation. And I was like, I'm not experiencing that temptation. I think I've been spared because I just love Jesus so much. Um, of course, we know how this story goes on. Um, and so we know that I was, in fact, not spared from having a sin nature. Um, but... I will say that I have been, uh, so far in my life, spared from a particular aspect of experience of the sin nature, which is the temptation to lust after women. Um, right? I mentioned earlier that for many of you, it would probably not be a good idea for you to, you know, 
enter into spaces where you're going to encounter a lot of female nudity. Um, I could be dropped into a room full of naked women and my only thought would be, oh, my dearly loved sisters in the Lord, like, let me get a blanket for you. Um, and I think that the absence of that kind of sexual temptation is actually a particular kind of beauty in my life. Um, so my question would be, if we think that the ideal for me is that my capacity to know that sometimes to the degree I experience sexual temptation, it will be in a certain direction. If you could take that away from me and instead give me the capacity to be tempted to lust after the opposite sex, would that improve my life? Would that improve my obedience to Jesus? I would posit to you that the answer is no because I think the only meaningful thing it would change in my life is that it would perhaps make it more likely that I would find myself called into marriage. Um, and yet it seems to me that both Jesus and the Apostle Paul are quite clear that singleness is actually a good and beautiful vocation within which followers of Jesus can steward our lives and our sexualities, right? As Paul says, the single man is concerned with the things of the Lord, how to please the, world, the Lord. So too, the, the, the single woman is concerned with the things of the Lord. She's devoted to the Lord in both body and mind. Um, uh, Jesus says of those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, he says the one who can accept this should accept it. Um, and so if I, having a capacity for a particular kind of sexual temptation while lacking a capacity for a different kind of temptation, find, it, find myself particularly well suited to singleness, then is that a disadvantage to me? Or does that make it possible for me to live precisely in the way that the Apostle Paul uh, seems to suggest he hopes some people do when he says at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter seven, speaking of his own singleness, I wish all of you were as I am, but some of you have one gift and some of you another. Um, it's really hard for me to wish that I could develop a capacity to experience opposite sex sexual temptation. And on that note, I will close us for now. I sort of feel sorry for Chris. He's sitting back there talking to himself. Uh, <laughs> just one little microphone and saying this. <laughs> Chris will put up with it. Okay, uh, a number of things to get to here, but I, I think we're moving toward uh, the discussion that we'll be having during the cross-examination period. Um, <clears throat> it is my recollection, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, Gregory, that at some point, you have, you, you, mentioned, you made reference to a lifelong struggle, but I seem to recall reading you saying something along the lines that uh, I'm not asking people to pray for me any longer. Uh, if, if you could give me a no longer gay pill and a Tylenol, I'd take the Tylenol. Does that sound familiar? Okay, um, and so that seems to me I, we need to discuss what that means. Is there still a struggle here? Is there still, uh, and I don't just mean a struggle in the sense of, yeah, it's tough living this way in this context. I'm sort of on the outs. There's a lot of people who just don't understand my experience. Or are we saying that there is still a struggle, but the struggle is how to sublimate these desires, how to sanctify these desires, how to utilize these desires? Or is there a recognition that the desire is itself against the creation ordinance? That it does not fit with the created purpose of God in regards to men and women, the function of the family and things like that, so that, well, but we have eunuchs. Uh, and we have, we have Paul talking about uh, because of the times that it would be best uh, to be able to be focused upon what's taking place. And the assumption that that means that is normative for the rest of the church age as well. And that gets us into eschatology and the specific things that were going on in Corinth at the time and the coming Christian persecution and all the other things that would then be relevant to any type of discussion of, of that type of application. And so we're hearing about, well, these desires are unchosen, uh, these desires are um, mere unchosen existence of these things that I just simply experience. Okay, but 
Here's the question. I pointed out that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you likewise had covetousness. And I'm going to be interested in, in understanding why Gregory doesn't feel that that is likewise a experience. I've certainly counseled people in the, my pastoral work over 40 years now, and they have been consumed by covetousness and all the ways in which that, that takes place. But it's not an act. It's not something where I went out and I was covetous today. Uh, and boy, that guy didn't see what was happening when I covetoused him. It's an attitude. It's an attitude of the heart. It's a, it's a matter of the object of one's desires. And so the question that I have that I think is very important this evening is there in the gospel, in washing, in sanctification, in justification, is there a promise to those who experience greediness, covetousness, swindling, sexual sins, idolatry? Does the gospel promise to break the power of that sin or not? And when we say, but yes, but see, but arson acquaintance, it just means those who, who committed the act without the desire to commit the act. When Paul describes homosexuality in Romans chapter 1, he talks about men burning with desire for other men. It's mutuality. That's why so many of the excuses for Romans chapter 1 in various the revisionist literature just simply fall on their face because what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 1 is not some uh, rich person slave, older person child, all those other excuses that side A uh, people use. Uh, but it is instead focused very, very much upon a mutual relationship. And certainly it says they burned with desire toward one another. That is the orientation of the heart. That's the experience of sexual desire. So if that's the description that Paul has, are we going to separate that out from his language in 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 1 and say, oh no, the, the desire, that's not... That's, that's not the issue here. And I am not talking about as soon as you're converted, you have sinless perfection either. What I am saying is that washing, sanctification, and justification results in a changed heart and a person who desires to now begin to cultivate those disciplines and those desires that will line up with the will of God. And so certainly there may have been those people in Corinth. We know that the temple prostitution in Corinth was rampant and particularly pernicious. And they may have been involved with that and they didn't want to be, but were forced to be a part of that. And so you could say, well, all he is saying is that that vile sin that they had undergone over and over and over again has been washed away. They will never be held accountable for that. Christ pays the penalty of that sin, and they are made a new creature in Christ. Okay? But what about those people who wanted those activities? Who in, what about the men who went to those uh, temples and engaged in homosexual activity? Is there no hope for them? Is that washing and that justification and that sanctification is that just for the past acts and not for the desires that led to those acts? These are the questions that we need to deal with this evening. Now, I just want to mention, um, in regards to uh, Dr. Cole's book, he does, a few pages later, make reference to the Greek Septuagint and those issues. But in the talk that you gave at a Southern California church, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name, the pastor interviewed you and asked questions and was basically going, dude, uh, over and over again, <laughs> okay? Oh, I think I know what you're you, I, I, I will never forget uh, that particular uh, experience of listening to that. Dude, that's just incredible. Anyways, when you talked about arsenicoites in your sermon presentation, whatever it was, when you weren't, when the pastor wasn't up there, um, you didn't get to that part. 
and so that was my concern, is that it sounded like there was a, in that instance, uh, your comments in regards to um, uh, Genesis 18 and 19, you've gone to Ezekiel, which is uh, it's just a concern, and I, I may ask about some of those issues a little bit later on if they are directly relevant to what we are, we are talking about. I was not seeking to misrepresent anything, uh, but just see, pointing out that that particular I, um, objection that, well, arsenos and koite, it doesn't necessarily mean that any more than, a, than butterfly means that, is not the basis of the argumentation that we are, that we are may, uh, presenting at all. So, the issue for us tonight, and this is, I was concerned about this from the beginning, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Because for the vast majority of Christians, you've never heard a side B presentation as Gregory has, has made it. And Chris will confirm this, and some other people will confirm this, that I had said, no, my challenge tonight is that the vast majority of folks that I've talked to have given a very, uh, they, they've just not even begun to understand how a person could make the argumentation that, well, I think a narrow application of the term gay, not the activity, not the lifestyle, to the term Christian, is an accurate representation of what I experience as an individual within the church. Now, I, I, could, I really think I could make a strong argument that given the nature of what we see every June in our country now, that that would be enough in and of itself to say, yeah, I don't think that's the right term. Because you're asking, honestly, you're asking us to somehow separate out the full court, in your face, down your throat, presentation of rainbow flags and everything else and all the other stuff that's becoming associated with that and attaching it to the term Christian for a narrow application. I think that's really problematic. And I'm going to have to ask during the cross-examination, you've identified yourself in the, in the book as part of the LGBTQ community and as a sexual minority. That likewise, I think, impacts how we are to understand the term gay as you are using it and how we can understand that as well. So, creation ordinance, meaning the text, we've got the basis, now we've got the opportunity for, for dialogue and discussion. Let's do it. Thank you. Well, I believe uh, someone is going to be moving the pulpit at this point because our cross-examinations are beginning. Uh, there is going to be a first cross-examination session before the break where Dr. James R. White is going to be questioning Gregory Coles. And Dr. White is only to be asking questions. He's not to be giving speeches. And uh, Gregory Coles is only to be answering questions and not asking questions of his own or giving speeches either. And so now we'll have uh, Dr. White begin his 15-minute cross-examination session. Okay, uh, let's get a few details out of the way that, that, that I think are going to be relevant to really understanding uh, our, our positions here. Uh, the way you looked at me just now was strange when I said, in your book, you do identify yourself as being part of hmm. the LGBTQ community, right? Yeah. Um, and I think you also use the term sexual minority. I believe I do. Yeah, I think so. Um, I tried to do my homework. Um, so I sense, I sense a conflict between what you're saying about defining gay in a very narrow sense and the identification as being a part of the LGBTQ community. How do you, how do you understand that? Yeah, I, I would say I'm generally trying to use language in ways that I think will be uh, maximally understandable to, and especially, and I would say this is especially true when I wrote my book and was in grad school, but I think to this day, it, it remains my primary consideration is, as I'm talking to folks who uh, are part of the LGBTQ community, um, 
Uh, what, are, what are ways that I can use language that's gonna be maximally understandable to them? Uh, and so I would say uh, for, for folks who would understand themselves to be part of that community, they would see the, the G of LGBTQ uh, as meaning gay. And so somebody who is gay, which is to say somebody who experiences attraction to the same sex would in that understanding be part of that community. Um, Do you think that, that, that your understanding of that just simply in the experience of attraction would be the, the normal way that someone in that, and I, I struggle with calling that a community because I see such contradiction between the letters. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I mean, plenty, plenty of people who would fall within that category would also similarly see some tension right. within those things. Right. For sure. Especially, I don't, I don't understand how, uh, when you see, see the T, mm -hmm. isn't that fundamentally not only contradictory to your understanding of human sexuality, but, but how can a, a biblical Christian even begin to go there is, is one of the questions I had when I read your, when I was listening to your book, I was driving through New Mexico. And so I remember exactly where it was. I was like, man, I've got to ask him. How, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you put that together? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think those are vastly different conversations as you're saying. And so I, I would hate to try to conflate uh, the, the two conversations with one another. I think the fact that they have wound up in the same acronym together, um, there are a number of cultural and political reasons that those groups found some alignment with each other. Um, but I think uh, it seems to me it's often helpful to make a distinction. Um, and so even though the acronym LGBTQ gives us broadly a sense of, oh, we're talking about people with non-normative experiences of sexual attraction and or gender identity, that those are some really, really different stories and also really different ways of responding to those stories. So I think the question you started to ask at the beginning of this question was, do people who uh, identify themselves as LGBTQ think it's weird uh, that I would also use that label as somebody who's not pursuing same-sex sexual expression? I think the answer is, they think it's weird that I'm not trying to have sex, but they would think that was weird for everybody, right? Like they think it's weird when straight people are not trying to have sex, they just think it's all kind of weird to not seek out the kind of sex you would like to be having. But I've never had anybody uh, tell me that they didn't think it was accurate or true to the definition of the word gay for me to use that word to describe myself, even as somebody who was pursuing celibacy. Right, so a, a celibate experience in that community is by far the minority. Very much so, yes. very much so, yeah. Okay, so are, are you, do you see yourself as an individual who is reaching out specifically to that community? I think I, one of the, one of the things that pushed me out of uh, total silence on this topic uh, and toward beginning to, beginning to say something about my experience was being, being in grad school uh, and, and friends with uh, other gay folks who were not Christians and who when I heard them talk about this topic, I just felt like these people feel so alienated from the church. They feel so alienated from the people of God. And I wanted to, I wanted to say something that felt like it would, uh, that felt like it would begin to open up the possibility that Jesus might still be interested in them. And so I think my, my choice of language was absolutely motivated by a desire to communicate truths about the gospel to that group of people. Did you agree with me when I said that homosexual desire is disordered from a creation ordinance perspective? Um, I, so, uh, first of all, I, I think the word desire in English can get us into trouble uh, in part because it's commonly used to translate the Greek word epithumia, which also gets translated lust. Um, and so I find, it, I find it tricky if we're using the word desire and then pointing to epithumia, which then is getting translated lust, then sometimes I think, uh, again, to make that tripartite distinction between the capacity for attraction, the actual spirit, experience of attraction, and then lust, which I would see as being the shift from the unchosen receipt of, oh, this is a temptation, toward sort of the, not, not physically behavioral, but the behavioral choice of the mind 
uh, into lust is how I would make the distinction between those latter two categories. Um, so I would see, I would say that all three of those things, uh, capacity for sexual temptation, the experience of sexual temptation, and lust, I would see all of those things as uh, being, uh, being part of our inheritance of the fall of humankind. And I would want to be quick to add that I would also see the capacity of people who are attracted to the opposite sex to experience sexual temptation toward people they are not married to, to have uh, an actual experience of temptation, to choose lust, I would see those things as also being uh, reflections of our inheritance of the fall of humankind. Okay, but what does, when, when Paul says that this is parafusin, it is against nature. Yeah. Uh, uh, is, 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 does that indicate something to you that would uh, cause you to distinguish between a heterosexual um, lust or desire outside of marriage and any form of homosexual desire? I think uh, two things seem to me really significant to uh, how we would apply the term parafusin here to this conversation. Uh, one is that, uh, that that term is being applied in the context of Romans 1, which is notable among the, uh, among the passages in Scripture that mention same-sex sexual behavior. Romans 1 is notable in that it's the only one that mentions same-sex lust. Um, also notable in that it's the only one that mentions female-female sexual behavior. All the rest um, are just male same-sex sexual behavior. Um, so I, I would see Romans 1 as being concerned both with sexual behavior and with lust. Um, and I would see parafusin as uh, being uh, applied to both of those things. Um, I am, however, I think I'm less comfortable in making, uh, making the, the shift in saying everything that Paul says about same-sex sexual behavior and lust, he must therefore also mean about the capacity to experience same-sex sexual temptation, which is kind of the, uh, the, the exegetical move I heard you make in 1 Corinthians 6, right? We heard Paul say arsenakotai, which is a behavioral word, but I think we should really apply his words also to this pre-behavioral experience. I think I'm generally less comfortable than you seem to be in shifting our conversation away from the, the literal meaning of Paul's words and toward kind of a pre-behavioral experience. Are you comfortable assuming that Paul's words in Romans 1 are an appropriate exegetical and contextual background for understanding his use of malakoi and arsikokoitai in 1 Corinthians 6. Is it, is it okay to assume consistency on the apostles' part at this point? I, I think it's very, I, I'm a big fan of reading the whole Pauline corpus together. Right. Yes, absolutely. Right. Okay. so. The terms that Paul uses, I, we are in agreement that verses 26 and 27 are specifically in regards to male and female experience of homosexual desire. Because you, you mentioned, you know, it says uh, the same way also the, or, or the, even their women, their females exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. Yep. Would... Again, the language there in most translations uh, burned with lust. Um, so uh, insofar as I find it helpful to make a distinction between lust and, uh, again, the capacity to experience attraction or the specific experience of attraction, uh, I would see that passage as, as being nominally concerned with lust, um, which is not to, say, not to say that there are not useful themes to be taken from that passage in our, our understanding of a pre-lustful condition. It's just to say that I want to stay tied to what's actually in the text. I think, we, I think you may have confused verse 27, burning lust with the males, with what I was looking at, the, the females, because it, when it says, for this reason God gave them over to dishonorable passions, pathe atamias. Hmm. Would you agree with me that this is applied both to the females as well as to the males? This is a dishonorable passion. Oh, would I agree that pate atimias is, is, a, is a statement being made about both males and yes, females? Yes, yes, I would agree with that. Okay, so there is an element of desire being discussed in Romans 1. Would, is that appropriate, therefore, on Paul's part to assume that when he's talking about the same topic in 1 Corinthians 6, that desire is still there because you've made a, you've made a, you said you're uncomfortable 
with that connection in 1 Corinthians 6, right? I'm, I'm not uncomfortable connecting 1 Corinthians 6 to Romans chapter 1. What I'm uncomfortable with is you taking a word that's specifically about sexual behavior in 1 Corinthians 6 and then imputing to that word statements about a general capacity for attraction that don't seem to be in the mind of Paul, even in Romans 1, let alone 1 Corinthians 6, which is the text at hand. So the desire, the, the, un, the dishonorable passions, natural function for that which is parafus and uh, against nature, these are just about activities. They, there is nothing here about a, a lesbian couple that have desire for one another. That is not parafusen. I, I think uh, I think lust again, as I, as I said before, lust is clearly at issue in Romans chapter one, and so I think lust is condemned as is sexual behavior. What I what I think would be greatly ironic is for us to take that passage. I'm just the clock's back there, so I don't have a clock in front of me. Sorry. Um, no, you're good. Didn't um, mean to throw you off. No, no problem at all. What I think would be ironic is for us to take this passage um, and and to to gain from it the conclusion that there's therefore something about the experience of the, the capacity for same-sex sexual temptation uh, that we ought to think of as, as worse, as more fallen um, than the capacity for opposite-sex sexual temptation toward people we're not married to. Because it seems to me that Paul offers us in Romans chapter 2 verse 1 a bit of a key for understanding our application of that passage which is you therefore have no excuse you who cast judgment on someone else because what, at whatever point you judge someone else you yourself stand condemned because you who judge do the very same things. Um, and so it seems to me we have in Romans chapter 1 this clear condemnation. I, again I, I agree that it's a clear condemnation of both same-sex sexual behavior and same-sex lust. Um, and I think the invitation given to us by Paul is to see that and to say, hey, if it's easy for you to look at this and see that this is not part of the thing that God intends for us, um, then the best thing for you to possibly do in response to that reality is to look back at yourself and see that you too are also an inheritor of the fall of humankind. You don't see Paul's discussion in Romans 1 as being an example of the twistedness or disordered, that's terminology I use, the disorderedness that comes to creation even to the point where for their females exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. You don't see that as properly being called a disordered desire in a category that is different from um, any kind of prohibited heterosexual outside of marriage experience. You don't see that, what, it sounded like what you just said was, it doesn't seem like there's really a distinction that is being made by the apostle at that point. I, th I, think, that, I think that Paul is absolutely concerned with uh, the twistedness of humankind, and I think, I think he sees that particular expression of twistedness as being effective to his analogy. Um, what I don't know that Paul gives us license to do uh, is to create some kind of hierarchy in which we ought to look at that form of twistedness and see it therefore as a reason to see other forms of twistedness as less twisted. It, it seems to me that the invitation of Paul, again in the, in the ordering of the passage, in the way that first Romans ch uh, chapter 1 is meant to bring us to Romans chapter 2, it seems to me that Paul's logic is rather, do you see how twisted this is? Guess what? That's you. That is the twisted state of humankind. That is, that is all of us. Do you think that the apostle would have identified an act of adultery as parafusen in the same way he describes homosexuality in Romans 1, against nature? Uh, no, I would say, I would say uh, the, the times when Paul seems particularly concerned uh, with uh, identifying fusen and identifying a thing as being uh, parafusen against nature, uh, seem to me tricky in part because, I mean, we have, we have Romans 1, but we also have uh, the notion of fusin in 1 Corinthians 11 related to head coverings. And so I want to understand what Paul's up to with fusin, but I don't want to be over quick in making my conclusions just based on Romans chapter 1 when I would want to take into account things like 1 Corinthians 11 as and well. And we're out of time. And now uh, Dr. Gregory Coles will question James White for 15 minutes. 
and Gregory will only ask questions and not give speeches, and Dr. White will only answer questions and not give speeches. You can give short speeches if you want. I, I'd like to do, do it just to bother Chris, but. <laughs> um, I, I, would love, I would love to hear uh, what you think, what you think would be the, the fruitful path of obedience for somebody in my shoes? Because I think, I think that'll be fruitful for me to understand and, and for our uh, crew here as well. Like, yeah, what do, you, what do you think a life of faithfulness looks like? If not for me, you know, if, if perhaps I'm too far gone in various ways, give us sort of the, the paradigmatic vision of what faithfulness does look like. That's a pretty, uh, pretty wide question there that uh, could lead me to making speeches that Chris Arnzen doesn't like. But, um, <laughs> maybe maybe I, linguistically I, I is a good to, place to begin. If, if, the question, if, if the question overall is too broad. No, no, no. I, 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 I tried to make a few, I, I made a few statements in my opening to, that would give you a foundation here. But I believe that it involves the regular discipline of one's desires and one's goals in light of what scripture tells us God has created us to be. And so mm. that, is, that is by discipline, we seek to create within us the desire, first of all, to honor and glorify God rather than fulfill our own, our own desires. And then in asking, well, what does that look like and what does that mean? Then we begin to work toward desiring those things that God would have us to desire. And so, um, if I could use an example from someone you and I both know, uh, but in Rosaria Butterfield's uh, book, uh, which just came out, uh, called Five Lies, one of the stories that she, she tells is the process that she went through hmm. in coming to love things that God commanded her to love hmm. and how that changed hmm. her desires, her understanding of what fulfillment is, her understanding of, of what obedience to Christ actually looks like. And so we recognize that's, that that's not necessarily something that happens overnight, but it is something that is, we are to be, that the church is to be encouraging someone in your position to be doing, is that discipline, which is not the same thing as I have heard from some people, if we can contrast this, some people from the revoice side B, side AB, if there is somewhere, there is sort of a mixture. Let's be honest, it's, it's not like there's a straight line over here and a straight line over here and everybody, you know, there's, there's a mixture, I think, in between. I, th I think you'd probably agree with that. Um, but it's not sublimating that kind, uh, that is language that has been used by mm -hmm. certain people, sublimating that desire so that it becomes, um, well, and I, and I can't ask you this question, but uh, a theoretical mosquito before, create, before the fall type of a situation. Hmm. If you, that, we're going to have to explain that because <laughs> everyone just lost where we went, didn't they? Do you want to explain it or shall I? Uh, well, please, go ahead. If that's okay, Chris, let him explain that context. <laughs> We've, we've gone rogue, people. Um, so so uh, at, the, at the beginning of one of the chapters of my book, uh, I, I'm meditating on the question of uh, what our prelapsarian experience, that is our experience before the fall, might have been like. Um, and I talk about how uh, my dad and I used to wonder what mosquitoes were like before the fall because we were like, mosquitoes just suck. They're the worst. Like, there's nothing good about mosquitoes. So we were like, were mosquitoes like a post-fall invention? Or is there like a form of the mosquito before the fall that is good and beautiful and, and fruitful even though now they suck because the fall sucks? So having now explained that, that what you understood because I read your book, um, what my concern is that the, the revealed creation ordinance gives us clarity as to what desires we should discipline and develop in our lives. Hmm. And hence, if, if we recognize the goodness of family, the goodness of community, then we are seeking to create those desires that will lead us to fulfillment within that context. Yeah, yeah. So. Um so would you say then that if, 
if I, in the process of my sanctification, uh, were to find that uh, I entirely lost my capacity for uh, attraction to the opposite sex, and in its place I gained sort of an equivalent capacity for attraction to people of the opposite sex to whom I was not married, would you see that as sort of a, like a valuable change in substance? Like if I could go from being what we might in you know, general terms call gay in capacity for attraction and become what we might call straight in capacity for attraction, would the shift, if, all, if, if, we, if we couldn't reduce the, the degree of capacity for temptation, um, but all we could do was just shift it away from the same sex and toward the opposite sex, would you see that as an improvement? I would see that as a movement away from that which is disordered to that which is in line with the creation ordinance. And hence, if I seek, if I recognize I am living in God's world, then I want to live in God's world in such a fashion as to reflect his creation ordinance and how he made me. So when you talk about, uh, for example, eunuchs and, and things like that, or even the singleness mm. in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, when, when Paul talks about singleness, he's talking about that within the context of uh, the difficult times coming of, of persecution and things like that. It's not fleeing from or sublimating or in some way sanctifying disordered desires. Hmm. There's the difference. And so if moving from disordered desire to a creation ordered desire is to use the language of your question, a, I think you said good thing or positive thing, I'm not sure which one you use, um, then I would say yes. But it is only in reference to growth in truly desiring to be used of God and to be willing to let go of anything and to begin to love that which I've not loved before. Hmm. That's, part of, that's part of sanctification as far as, as I can understand it. And if, if I can get a 30-second sermon in here, it's one of the greatest failures of the modern church is that we allow the world to define for us what we're to love hmm. rather than the difficulties of the New Testament telling us what we are to love, which may mean we have to give up a whole lot of things that are very precious to us. So. Sure, sure. I mean, on that count, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with you that pro-sanctification and also pro-developing and increasing capacity to love God. Um, but I'm not answering questions. I'm asking them. Uh, He's not listening to us right now. Don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, uh, actually, re, re the, the question of uh, uh, the category of eunuch. Um, uh, if, if, if Chris will allow me... Um, uh, let me, I, I want to I read you a passage from Robert Gagnon that I found fascinating. Um, uh, I, I assume you know Robert. I'm not really big on his choice of Mexican food when we had dinner in Houston recently, but um, uh, we did share lots of chips and salsa together. So yes, I'm, I'm very familiar with Bob Gagnon. Okay, well, um, uh, here in the, in the context of understanding, yeah, what, what the category of eunuch is, may or may not mean and how we should or shouldn't understand the way it shows up. Um, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. So here's what, here's what Gagnon writes. He says, probably born eunuchs, right? He's, he's borrowing here the language of Matthew chapter 19, um, uh, where Jesus responding to a question about divorce says, some were born eunuchs, some were made eunuchs, and some have eunuched themselves. Uh, the Greek says, uh, ha have chosen to live like eunuchs is the way I think the NIV translates it now. Um, but Gagnon, responding to that first category of born eunuchs, he says, probably born eunuchs in the ancient world did include people homosexually inclined, which incidentally puts to the lie the oft-repeated claim that the ancient world could not even conceive of conceive of persons who were congenitally influenced toward exclusive same-sex attractions. I have always argued that homosexual orientation is not a radically new concept. Any argument that is made about born eunuchs, including homosexual persons, with which I would agree, leads to the view that Jesus did not give homosexually oriented persons the option of sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman. Um, so a couple things I find what, what, was the end, what was the end of that? Uh, he says, uh, I'll read the last sentence. Uh, Any argument that is made about born eunuchs, including homosexual persons, with which I would agree, he says, 
leads to the view that Jesus did not give homosexually oriented persons the option of sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman. Um, so in a way that actually quite surprised me, he takes that, that passage about born eunuchs and says, this actually does include what he's calling homosexually, homosexual persons um, or elsewhere homosexually oriented persons. Um, and, and using that to, to make an argument which I would agree with, which is the argument that Jesus doesn't carve out special license for people who might be attracted to the same sex and say, well, if you're that way, then go ahead and pursue a same-sex marriage. So I, I absolutely agree with the point that he's making here, but I'd love to hear your reflections on that treatment of the eunuch and how that shapes what you were just saying about the category of eunuch. Well, I'll, I'll confess that the last sentence still doesn't, doesn't ring with me. I'm not exactly sure what his point is. I'm obviously missing something, the context that he was referring to there, but be that as it may, uh, I don't think that, uh, well, obviously, to make the term, the, the, the category of eunuch, wide enough to have a subset of homosexuals within it, uh, and then to try to draw anything out from that, I think is, is really uh, problematic. Okay, so, so you would disagree with Gagnon's textual I, work here? I, I, don't think that there's, I don't think that it can be utilized in such a way as to really come to any conclusions as to how we're to view homosexuals because there were some who were born that way in the Old Testament there were physical maladies that excluded a person from the congregation of Israel sure and I don't think homosexuals want to necessarily say well that's the only category that we exist in uh, there was it was physical uh, it's just like the transgender stuff there are people who have genetic issues that are intersex but the vast majority of the transgender stuff has absolutely positively nothing to do with that at all. And so I, I don't know that it's, that it's appropriate to necessarily make any application out, outside of saying, well, okay, if there were certain people that just never got married, they never had that kind of attraction, whatever mm. else, it, uh, else it is, maybe they ended up in the official positions. Because eunuch is used sure. in, the, in the Greek Septuagint as primarily actually a governmental position yeah. that had to do with well, you're not going to get any of the king's wives pregnant, therefore you can be trusted to be in places that no one else can be in, basically is what, it, is what it's about. Um, I, I think trying to draw anything else out from that uh, becomes extremely problematic, um, and, I, and I, I don't know that I necessarily recognize what the context of what Bob is saying, because that last part of it didn't make any sense to me. It, I don't know how that, how sex between a male and a female would be relevant in that context at all, but anyway. Okay, yeah, well that's, that's helpful, thanks. Um, uh, getting, uh, getting back to the, the, question, of, the question of sanctification, um, I, I'm curious uh, how you would see that for, uh, let's, let's take a married man, not to make the conversation altogether male-centric, but it feels like a handy analog since I am male and so are you and you know, here we are. Um, uh, when you envision the experience of progressive sanctification for the married man, would you say it would ever be appropriate for that man to expect uh, his sanctification to evolve in such a way that he would altogether lose the capacity to ever experience attraction or sexual temptation towards other women who he is not married to? Well, Do you think I, that's a realistic goal of sanctification? I, 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 I don't believe in Wesleyan perfectionism or, or anything along those lines. I didn't um, peg you for a Wesleyan. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. And uh, though I think you've got some of that in your background. Yeah, I'm something of a theological mutt, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, well, you know where you are here. And so, um, <laughs> uh, so I, I don't believe in, in, in perfectionism, but I, I would say that, that it is quite possible to uh, come to a point where uh, that just simply would be such a wildly uh, outside the, the po realm of possibility kind, type of thing that there are, are couples that have come to that, that level of, of sanctification and of love for one another. And um, really, if you, honestly, I, I don't have time to expand upon this, but really, if, if over a course of a marriage, my parents were married, I think, 50, 54 years or something like that before my mom died, uh, if, if over that period of time you have cultivated an appropriate uh, focus upon that woman as the fulfillment of God's gift to you, 
uh, she becomes your all in all. I could, I could certainly see how a person would go, no, I, I'm not going to be, I'm certainly not going to be attracted to some woman that walks by in a tight skirt type of situation. I, I could see that, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean I'm perfectly sanctified, but I could, I could definitely see something like that happening, yeah. Well, even though we have 12 seconds left, we don't have time for another question. So. Oh, no, I love to sneak questions right in. That way you get more time. <laughs> well, we are going uh, to our uh, break, which will be 10 minutes. Please take advantage of this time to write a question if you have any intention to do so. Please also identify at the very top of the card who the question is for. And it can be for both debaters, or it could be for one. And uh, we will, uh, at the very end, as I said earlier, have a half hour of Q&A. But when we return immediately after the break, we're going to have the second round of cross-examination. So enjoy the break, and we'll see you in 10 minutes. <clears throat> OK, folks, if you will return to your seats. And if you have uh, not submitted your your question, raise your hand and somebody will get your question from you. Uh, if the volunteers from Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society will please look around for anybody raising their hand and grab the uh, questions. And uh, I hope that you all have, uh, just keep your hand raised until somebody takes your question. And there are people walking around, so don't be overly concerned. All right, if I could have your attention, we're going to resume with the second cross-examination section or session. And uh, I guess I'm going to have to rephrase the restrictions because of the complaints I'm having from both of my debaters. <laughs> How about no endlessly rambling, filibustering, changing subjects, and mocking the moderator? Is that okay? <laughs> We're gonna I will not accept that second addition. <laughs> um, that is just a necessary aspect of the debate. All right. We're going to start with uh, Gregory Coles questioning James White for 15 minutes. Sorry. You've got to do it for half an hour in a row. That's pretty tough. <laughs> we carry on. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, this works out well because we can, we can just kind of pick up where we left off. Um, so you were, you were describing, uh, as we were wrapping up our time before the break, uh, married couples. You're young. You, you still have short-term memory. I don't remember what we were talking about. So That's, that's why I'm you know, <laughs> laying the groundwork for us. So we were talking about these married couples who, through the process of sanctification right. over the course of time, perhaps in some cases by the grace of God, um, completely lose the capacity to experience sexual temptation toward anyone other than their spouse. Um, uh, it's, it sounded like you would say that experience of having that be totally gone is relatively rare. Is that a fair assessment of what you were saying? Uh, I think it probably was more common in the past than today. We live in such a sex-soaked society um, that uh, standards of modesty and things like that are, are specifically meant to, I think, try to preclude that. Mm. But what I'm saying is there is a, a growth in a marriage that is godly, that recognizes this is the woman, speaking as a man, that God prepared for me, and my life is fulfilled because I am with her, and therefore I would never do anything to seek to hurt her, and therefore I would not sure. desire. Maybe, maybe it's maybe what I'm talking about is the recognition that to give in to any type of desire for someone else would be so devastating that I could never even imagine that consequence. And that's where I see a connection to what I was saying to you. And that is in growth and sanctification, I want to grow in not hurting the heart of Jesus in his expression of God's will for my life. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and that's part of why I think as a single person, I love the language of 1 Corinthians 7, and I know you would see that as maybe having some contextual constraints that I wouldn't, but, um, but the language that appears in 1 Corinthians 7 talking about singleness, uh, right, the, 
the single man is concerned with the things of the Lord, the single woman is devoted to the Lord in both body and mind. It seems to me that whether married or single, um, the opportunity to see one's sanctification as increasingly ordering you toward, I, I'm, so, I'm so in love with my spouse if I am married, and regardless, uh, I'm so in love with Jesus that the thought of doing something that would violate the covenant I have with Jesus is unthinkable. Right. Uh, and that's why the issue of whether certain desires are disordered or not, because Jesus is the creator of all things. He's the one who, you know, is described in Colossians 1, for by him are all things made, whether heaven and earth, visible, invisible, principalities, powers, dominions, authorities, all things created by him, for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. That means that living in light of the creation ordinance is part of what it means to love Jesus. And so that's why I keep coming back to um, dis, you know, dishonorable passions, disordered desires. Um, that's something that I would think sanctification would bring about repentance of. Because repentance is not just my acts. I've had to repent very often of having had attitudes toward others, of having had attitudes toward people groups or whatever else it might be. I didn't act on any of those things, but repentance has to be part of that. And so that's where I'm, that's where I think this discussion, that's where we'll go in the next 15 minutes yeah, anyway. Yeah, and I, I look forward to it. But before we get there, I'd love for us to lay a little more linguistic groundwork um, because it sounds to me like you're describing the, the typical experience within marriage uh, for say, uh, I'm going to say the straight man because that language is familiar to me, but if you don't like that language, feel free to sub in other language and we can come back to it. Um, uh, but the typical marital experience would be, this is a person who, desiring to be obedient to Jesus, desiring to honor his wife, uh, who also probably to some degree needs to recognize hey, you still have the capacity to experience sexual temptation. Um, and so you're gonna, need to, you're gonna need to think about your life in such a way uh, as to not create unnecessary opportunity for temptation. You're gonna need to figure out how to, how to steward your experience in a way that responds to that temptation. Would you agree that having the self-awareness to say, I know myself well enough, I can say along with the Apostle Paul, Christ came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Um, like, I know that that capacity exists within myself. Would you say that it's appropriate for, uh, for a married man to be able to make that acknowledgement? Well, it's, it, it's necessary for a married man to do those things that are necessary to avoid sexual sin. But what I'm saying is the most effective and efficient way of doing that is by cultivating the proper godly desires um, for that, that woman as the expression of God's gift to you, that marriage as a picture of Christ in the church, um, and to so grow there that it's the, it's, the, it's the positive experience and the positive growth and holiness that excludes the other. It, see, legalism says, here's all the do's and don'ts, and don't get your, don't get, get your nose dirty uh, over here. But a biblical holiness says the Spirit of God is active in our hearts and is conforming us to the image of Christ. That, that's why, and I would assume that you would agree, when I, when I look at like the word faith people who are constantly saying, <laughs> just you know, name it and claim it, profess it. You know, there, there are biblical passages where Jesus says, pray and it shall be done. But the context of that is speaking to people who are becoming so conformed to the will of God that when I pray, my prayer is in line with the will of God, and that's why what I pray for takes place, because it's in, in, in accord with the will of God. That all takes us back to the creation ordinance, though. Yeah. Well, let's... Uh... Let's put a pause on that and we can come back to it in eight minutes and 20 seconds. Um, yeah, right. Uh, but uh, bef before we get there, I, I, I agree with what you're saying about sanctification. I, I, I love it. Um, and yeah, and I would, I would want to affirm, as I hope you would too, that that's a process that can occur in marriage to an opposite sex partner, also a process that can occur in God-honoring singleness. Would you agree with that? That both marriage in and singleness? God-honoring singleness, yes. Okay. 
Yeah, and would you agree that, would you agree that it is possible for that singleness to be lifelong? Be, be what, lifelong? Lifelong singleness. Yes, but for what reason? So you would, you would contend that someone who chooses singleness uh, because they sense the Spirit leading them in that direction um, and does not sense an expectation that they will get married later in life, is that person in disobedience uh, for not seeking marriage more actively? A, I would think that given the entire witness of the New Testament, that's rather rare. B, my issue here when what I just said was it's the reason why one would seek singleness. And I, I, my concern is seeking singleness because of disordered desire. Would you see my absence of capacity to experience opposite sex sexual temptation as a disordered desire? Yes. So you would say, if I could lust after women, that would be more ordered than the fact that I don't experience temptation to lust after women? You're using language in a way that I think is um, problematic at this point, because we're specifically talking about the natural created order, and you're using language to say, well, I don't have a capacity to do this or a capacity to do that, when the created order is that God made people with certain capacities that will glorify him by bringing life into the world. Yes, but to, well. I, I keep going back to Romans 1. Dishonorable passions. Yes. Though, and, that, and that's not just the act. Though you would agree that the Apostle Paul is not talking about sexual orientation there, right? I don't think that the modern psychological concept of sexual orientation, uh, when it's crammed into scripture, creates all sorts of contradictions. I absolutely agree with you. I'm so glad you feel that way. So I wonder, uh, why, would we, why would we try to read Romans 1 as if it's a commentary on whether or not it's appropriate for me to use words that post-date scripture? If you're saying Romans 1 is not talking about sexual orientation, then why would it be inappropriate for me to adopt a linguistic category that's in vogue today and to say, hey, here's the language you're speaking. Let me talk to you about my experience in that language. Because How can Romans 1 give us a statement about sexual orientation, as you seem to be claiming it does, if sexual orientation doesn't come up because it can't come up in Romans 1? Because the, when I was talking about sexual orientation, I'm talking about the modern utilization of that in psychology and psychiatry today and the political utilization of that, I'm not talking about the fact that Paul understood there were such things as that which is natural, that which is a natural function, that which can be exchanged for something else, dishonorable passions. These are all the biblical terms that we have to utilize. And my, my position is that to engage in singleness because I have disordered passions, dishonorable passions, is not what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 7. Sure, so... So that's where the washing and the discipline and the creation of, uh, of, of working toward new desires comes in. Yeah, so, so let, me, let me clarify something uh, about my own language. Uh, uh, when, I, when I describe myself as gay, uh, I'm describing two things. One of which is the, the presence of the capacity for same-sex sexual temptation. The other of which is the absence of ever having an experience of opposite sex attraction or sexual temptation. Um, and to me, the fact that I have sometimes experienced attraction to the same sex is super irrelevant to the question of whether I'm called to be married because I think there are, I, I know plenty of people who find themselves sometimes attracted to both sexes and who choose to pursue uh, God honoring marriage to a person of the opposite sex. So that part to me is pretty irrelevant. The thing to me that has made it remarkably clear that I'm called to singleness is the absence of sexual attraction toward or sexual temptation toward women. And so I think my question is, if my singleness is motivated by an absence of sexual attraction or even the capacity for lust toward women, would you say that that is therefore an inappropriate motivation for singleness? Or is the fact that I don't experience sexual attraction toward the kind of person 
God might call me to marry, a great indicator that perhaps I'm precisely the kind of person Paul has in mind when he says in 1 Corinthians 7, I wish all of you were as I was, or when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, those who can accept it, that is the call to be a eunuch. Those who can accept it should accept it. Would you, well, I can't, I, I can't ask questions at that point. That was a lengthy statement, but uh, the, the, the problem is you're just, you are separating. You're making it sound like that a mere lack of desire for one thing can be distinguished and separated from the positive desire for something else. You said in your book that you have experienced um, lustful desires. You said in your book that you, you talked about gay porn. Yeah. Um, so it's not that, well, there's just, that's just over there and this is over there and we can separate them. We can't separate them because we've been made within God's creation and within that creation we made male and female and we are given sexual desires, and those sexual desires are either in accordance with the broad spectrum of God's created order, or they're not. And my point is that Romans 1 is saying that is a disordered desire. It is not a natural desire. We, can, we had actually stop, stopped at Parafusin before, but the context of Parafusin in Romans 1 is not hair length, uh, it's not it's not first Corinthians. It's not head coverings or anything else It is specifically in regards to God has made the world this way and when man rebels against that God gives them over to dishonorable passions and the question is should we repent of our dishonorable passions that's and and, and I would simply say if, if someone came to me pastorally and said I have these desires so should I abandon being a father or having a family or anything like that um, as, as a means of dealing with these positive desires. You're just defining this as not having a certain positive desire. I just don't think we can separate those two things out and not deal with the other positive desire that is there. Are you saying you don't think you don't think it's possible for some people to experience? Yeah, I, mean, I keep like, <laughs> do we have time for one more? I think we do. We do. So are, are you saying that you think that everyone who's attracted to the same sex is therefore not attracted to the opposite sex and vice versa? I'm just going with what you've said in your, in your context. I'm not talking about bisexuality or anything like that. I'm right, or, or asexuality, right which would be sort of the absence of sexual desire for both sexes. So we already have in those two categories, like ways of acknowledging, hey, sometimes you have both kinds of attraction. Sometimes you have neither. Sometimes you have one and not the other. I, don't, I happen to be a one. In scripture, I don't see that. Uh, I'm talking descriptively about human experience. Right. I want to interpret human experience through the lens of scripture. Oh, good. That's another thing we have in common. Well, we're out of time. And I'm going to ask both debaters, is it essential for you to have the podium back or the pulpit back when you yes. give your... Okay. So whoever uh, from Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society uh, can get ready to retrieve and replace the pulpit for the final five minute uh, statements, closing statements, after we have Dr. White's final cross-examination session. So uh, Dr. White, you now have 15 minutes to cross-examine Gregory Coles. Okay, um, a couple questions that uh, I, I wanna get to before we, we get, would you agree with what I just said that Parafusin in Romans 1 is in a completely different context than 1 Corinthians 11. Oh, would I agree that the context of those two passages is different? Very much so. And that hence the meanings, uh, the, the, the meaning of uh, against nature uh, ca can actually be sort of transcendental in, in Romans chapter 1, not just a cultural or um, uh, temporary type concept. Yeah, I'm not sure transcendental is the word I would choose, but... Yeah, probably not. <laughs> um, but I, I agree, I agree absolutely with the notion that what 1 Corinthians 11 seems to make in a more culturally bound context, a statement about hair length, uh, does seem to me si substantially meaningfully different than what's being discussed in Romans 1, 100%. Um, do you accept the, uh, the utilization, when I've, when I've said that you would basically hold uh, to the uh, side B uh, possession, would you, would you say, yeah, that's basically correct? I'm always cautious of 
uh, depicting the side B position as a singular thing right. because it is, a, it is a vast, it's a bit like saying the reformed position and being like, do you accept the reformed position? And it's like, I don't know, I can think of 176 reformed positions. Um, so I know a lot of people saying a lot of things that have broadly been lumped into the side B umbrella. I agree with some of them and not others. Okay. Um, would you agree with me that over the past number of years there has been a a trend where people who are side B end up as side A. Uh, Matt, uh, uh, Brandon Robertson, Matthew Vines. Uh, I, to my knowledge, neither Brandon nor Matthew would have self-described as side B prior to their current position. Would you say that both of them at one point in time specifically attempted to present themselves as maintaining an orthodox view of marriage and sexuality. Yes, I also think both of them at one point in time presented themselves as people who were not attracted to the same sex. Okay, so you don't really see that there have been many people on the side B side that have eventually moved uh, to a side A oh, side. Oh, I, I've, definitely, I've definitely seen people who would self-describe as side B and subsequently self-describe as side A but I've also seen people who have used ex-gay language to talk about themselves, who have subsequently become side A. Uh, I've seen people who uh, are sometimes broadly called side Y, which is a, I don't believe that God necessarily needs to change my attractions, but I don't feel like uh, it's appropriate for Christians to use terms like, like gay. Um, I've seen people in that category become side A. What I've seen is that it, it seems to be really difficult for a lot of people uh, to, to remain uh, in obedience to a historic Christian sexual ethic who experience same-sex attraction. Um, and I'm inclined to see that, well, I needn't commentate here. I have my theories about why that is, but I don't think we can look at a single approach, like say the side B approach, and say, ah, this is the reason that people are leaving, this is the off-road. Because if I think of Exodus International, for instance, which was a massive ex-gay organization uh, that thought that the answer to the experience of sexual attraction was for people to pursue sexual orientation change efforts, um, I think by and large, the legacy of Exodus International is a bunch of people either not Christian at all because they're very angry with their faith or very stridently side A. So you, I've not ever heard you say anything positive about any kind of um, seeking to change one's desires. I don't think I've ever heard you say, I've heard you say a lot of negative stuff about quote unquote ex-gay ministries and stuff like that. But I've never heard anything positive. Do you, do you feel like is homosexuality something to be repented of? Uh, I would love a definition of what you mean by homosexuality. I would say, uh, the, to me, uh, same-sex sexual behavior, absolutely something to be repented of. Uh, same-sex lust, absolutely something to be repented of. Uh, same-sex temptation, and again, this is Not where... Attraction. Uh, uh, general attraction or specific attraction. Again, if we're talking about the general capacity, the awareness that over the course of time, I happen to be aware that if I'm going to have a specific experience of attraction, I know what direction it will come from. I don't think my awareness of that general capacity is something to be repented of. As to the specific experience of, of temptation, a specific moment of attraction, that it seems to me uh, is a thing to flee as we're commanded to do with temptation. Um, uh, whether or not it's something to be repented of depends on our homardiology, our question of like what counts as sin, and that's a place where I recognize that I'm in reform territory here. Um, so yeah, you quoted Kuiper. I thought that was wow. That was <laughs> I was just trying to demonstrate that I can speak the lingo, you know. Oh yeah, um, I can tell. <laughs> and I and I think I think there's I think there's a lot there's a lot with which I find resonance in the reform tradition. Again, I'm a bit of a a bit of a mutt. Um, so calling me Wesleyan wouldn't quite be accurate, but when it comes to this particular question of homardiology, the question of whether being an inheritor of the fall of humankind um, is itself a morally culpable sin in need of repentance, um, I, I would side with the Wesleyan tradition in saying no on that one. But what I think is more more crucial to this conversation is I would say whether we're falling on the reformed side of that homardiological question or on the Wesleyan side of that question, 
I just want us to be really even-handed in recognizing we need to take the same approach to opposite sex sexual temptation, to opposite sex experience of being aware, hey, I might experience temptation in the future. Whatever we believe about those things and our need for repentance about those things, I think we should also believe about our capacity for same-sex sexual temptation. I want us to see sexual temptation as sexual temptation regardless. So the consistency of the desire for if, if you're going to experience, you, the, way, the language you use is if I'm going to experience desire, it's going to be in a same-sex orientation. That is not something that you believe is something to be repented of. I would say I hope by the grace of God that I will experience less and less sexual temptation as I grow in my faith, as I mature. Um, and I've already seen that process to some degree. Um, and I also have experienced sanctification as a journey of fits and starts and steps forward and steps back. Um, I would see fewer occasions for temptation as a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, I would not see a replacement of opposite sex sexual temptation in place of my same sex sexual temptation if I could make that one to one swap. I would not see that as less sinful. Um, I, I would see it as still equally in need of repentance. The Tylenol or the pill analogy that, I, that you- Precisely, was, yeah. And, and what I said was not like, if I could stop being ever experiencing sexual temptation. What I said is if you could give me a pill that turned me from gay to straight, in other words, take all the experience of capacity for temptation that I currently have and swap it out and give me, instead of a same-sex sexual temptation, give me an opposite-sex temptation, that's where I would take the Tylenol because I don't see that as an improvement in my ability to follow Jesus. In fact, if anything, in 21st century America, given, and you made reference to this earlier, Dr. White, like given the amount of, the degree to which men of my age are, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, fire hosed, that's not the word, there's a better word for it. Inundated, that's the word I was searching for, thank you for waiting for it. Uh, given the degree that men my age are inundated with pictures that are meant to be sexually suggestive of women, um, I actually find it at times remarkably convenient that I experience absolutely no temptation when I encounter those images. You keep using the term temptation as a synonym for attraction. Again, general attraction and specific attraction. But, but you keep using the term temptation when uh, none, of the, none of the married men in this, this room are going to talk about the temptation they have toward their wife. So you're using the term in such a way that it really doesn't communicate where we are here because the issue is the disorderedness or the unnaturalness of the object of the desire. And you don't see, you don't, you don't see that there would be, that you would be in a better position um, to be living in God's world and representing the creative order if your desires were those which God gave to Adam? Are you saying I would be in a I can't ask questions. Um, if you want to clarify, that's fine. Uh, are, are you asking? Chris, Chris fell asleep five minutes ago. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, are you asking if I think I would be in a better position to be obedient to Jesus if I were married? Would you be in a better position to be obedient? Would you be more obedient to Christ to have the desires that he built into his creation rather than desires that he calls ag against nature? Uh, again, I would, I would dispute your, your notion of uh, that, uh, the, the, your definition of desire there in Romans 1. I see Romans 1 as talking about lust and behavior. I don't think Paul is making a statement about sexual orientation because I don't think he had that category available to him. But, um, but, but desires, uh, let, uh, let's not use the term orientation. When it says males abandon the natural function of the female and burned in their desire toward one another, you might want to turn that into temptation but there is a mutuality that is involved there. The, the reflexive pronoun demonstrates that it goes both directions. I'm simply saying, do you not see, and this is, this is our difference, this is where we are, and this is, I think, what this debate's about. Do you not see that God is honored when we have desires that are in accordance with the way he created mankind rather than those that are parafusen against nature? 
Okay, a couple things. Number one, uh, I agree with that text. I would follow all the translators, which is many of them, who translate burned in their lust. Uh, I think lust is the best way of understanding what's being discussed, not some kind of pre-lustful attraction. Um, again, I think the English word desire is tricky, as I said earlier, um, because desire is used to translate the Greek word epithumia, and epithumia gives us this sense of lust. The word there is not epithumia. That's right. um, I'm aware of that fact. It's a rec uh, I think if we, so extra biblical uses of Greek New Testament terms is not the strongest suit of mine, um, but I will say I generally am of the opinion that when a rexe shows up in extra biblical Greek literature, uh, it seems to be in contexts that include sexual behavior and or lust. Um, I don't see it as being, as, I don't see orexe as being some commentary on the pre-lustful capacity to experience sexual temptation. Again, I don't think that's what's at issue in this particular text, and I think it would be wrong of us to inject that into it. So, I, I, I don't want to just stay on one thing, but this, is, this does seem to be the issue. Because when I ask you, is this something that needs to be repented of, you, you basically say no. And then you ask, well, are you saying that it would be better, better for me if Jesus did this for me and Jesus did that for me? And I'm simply saying it is better for a Christian to live consistently with the created order rather than to experience desires that are specifically used as an example. Because in my, in, in my reading of Romans chapter 1, these verses are an example of how deeply the twistedness of the creator-creation distinction becomes in the light of the human experience of sin. And so can you understand why for all of church history up until recently, uh, it has been understood that it is better to not have disordered desires than to have those disordered desires? Even if we're not talking about temptations, we're talking about desires. What is the object? Just as in covetousness, what is the object? And the object, when it's same sex, is different than the object in a male-female relationship. I, um, among other things, I would want to. I would want to challenge your notion that the vast majority of church history has. Uh, taken an interest in taking people's capacity for attraction to the same sex and converting it into capacity for the attraction to the opposite sex. Uh, I think there's, there's a wonderful history of how that narrative, the notion that you would be improved if you could get rid of your uh, opposite sex, or if you could get rid of your same sex attraction and develop opposite sex attraction, the way that comes into vogue. Uh, there's a great history of it called Still Time to Care by Greg Johnson, uh, who's <laughs> a reformed guy, though perhaps not the most beloved of this particular gathering. Um, I do think... Founder of Revoice. I do think his... Uh, uh, no, founder would be inaccurate. Uh, he pastors the church that hosted the first okay. conference. All right. um, uh, but uh, to... To answer your question a bit further, or do you want to ask a new question? Well, no. Uh, it, it, what you're, it sounds like what you're saying is the history of the church is interesting because we now have the we have now introduced these categories. But my my whole point is, but these categories have to be understood in the light of what Scripture says on these things. Do you believe 100%. Scripture? Scripture is sufficient. Or do we need these modern categories that have come from other sources? I don't think, I don't think we need modern categories or modern language. I think, uh, I think what we're invited to do as Christians is to understand the language that's being spoken around us and to try to speak uh, in, in a way uh, that helps the truth of Scripture be understandable in the idiom of the time, in the language of the time. Um, and so in the same way that we are now speaking English and not Koine Greek, I also think it's appropriate for us to understand the language being used around us and try to speak within it. And we're out of time. And uh, I guess no one from Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society heard me when I said I need the pulpit return for the closing statements. Oh, here, here they are. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.
And if you could just be ready to remove that when the closing statements are completed. And now, uh, Dr. Gregory Coles, you have the final five minutes of your presentation. Thanks, folks. This has been uh, a, an intriguing uh, and, I hope, uh, enlightening conversation. Um, I, I think there's a lot of value in us attending to... Uh, so, so the way this question is often asked, uh, right, the way we've framed it, uh, is, biblical, or is gay Christian a biblically acceptable identification for a member of Christ's church? Uh, the way I more often hear that question asked is simply can you be a gay Christian? Um, and I think there are, there are two ways that you can answer that question. Uh, one of which is uh, to, as we've done here, try to unpack, okay, what exactly do people mean by that term? What kinds of ideological baggage come with that term? Um, are those kinds of ideological baggage baggage that we would want to take on as followers of Jesus? Is that wise? Is that fruitful? Uh, is that in keeping with what we see in Scripture? Um, but uh, I think the more fundamental question that I often hear people asking when they ask, can you be a gay Christian, is, hey, I understand the word gay, as most dictionaries do, to mean attracted to the same sex. And I understand the word Christian to mean someone seeking to live in obedience to Jesus. My question is, can you do both of those things? Um, and I think for so many of those people, uh, as, as for me, um, it's, it's one thing to try to have an abstract debate about like, well, is this the best idea? Is this not the best idea? And I think, I think that debate can be fruitful and helpful. Um, but I think I would wanna remind us here at this moment um, that fundamentally the question we're asking is there are some people wondering if they can follow Jesus. Um, and and I, I hope that we are, I hope that we are thoughtful, I hope that we are biblically engaged in the ways that we encourage people to use or avoid certain kinds of language to describe their experience. Um, but in the end, I hope that we are most passionately convinced that when people ask the question, hey, I'm attracted to the same sex, is it possible for me to follow Jesus? Uh, can I be someone who desires to be a follower of God? Can I, even alongside the Apostle Paul, can I say, I think Christ came to save sinners of whom I am the worst, can I do that? Um, I hope that we will have the, the pastoral wisdom and grace to, to say yes, to, to invite those people, even, even if we believe, even if we believe that the journey of sanctification for that person might mean over time uh, a shift in their experience, that it might mean a choice to move away from that kind of language that we find reprehensible. Um, I think the bare question at the very beginning um, is, is this, is this something people can say about themselves? And if they say it about themselves, will there be room for them among us? Um, and so I hope, uh, I hope that in, in, all the, in all the discussion of uh, Greek, uh, which is great fun, I love Greek, uh, I hope that in all the discussion of Greek, we don't lose sight of the, the pastoral questions that underlie it, um, and most of all, that we don't lose sight of the, the people that underlie those pastoral questions. Um, because it seems to me that Jesus is remarkably good um, at seeing the people behind the questions that are asked. Uh, when I was, when I was uh, choosing language to begin to put around my experience, uh, I found myself reflecting on uh, the parable in, uh, I believe it's Luke 18, though sometimes the numbers are hard to me. Uh, the parable in Luke 18, um, where Jesus describes two people going to the temple to pray, um, and one of them goes and prays, thank you God that I am not like other men. Um, uh, and he lists his qualifications and he says, I'm not even like this tax collector here. Um, and then the tax collector goes to pray and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, and Jesus, in commentating on that parable, says, I tell you that this, this latter man, the tax collector, and not the other, went home justified. Um, uh, my own 
My own instinctive heart posture is to wanna take the heart posture of the person who goes to God with a list of qualifications, with a list of justifications. Um, uh, and among other things, my choice of the word gay was a way of seeking to come before God in honesty and say, God have mercy on me because that's the only way any of this will work. Um, so uh, you don't have to agree with me and that's, that's really quite all right. Um, but I hope, I hope that you can uh, have room in your heart to have pastoral sensitivity for people like me. Um, and I hope in that Jesus finds himself more greatly glorified. Thanks. And now Dr. James R. White will give his five-minute closing statement. Thank you very much for being here this evening. I told a few people during the break, I said, um, I knew that this debate would be very different than what most people expected it to be. Uh, most people have not heard a presentation from the other side. But I want to, in my last few moments, to express why I feel this is so important and continue to feel that it is so important. When we look at what Paul said to us in 1 Corinthians 6, what the Holy Spirit said through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there is hope in that text for a wide variety of people there in Corinth. Let's talk about covetousness. I don't really think we, I, don't re I didn't really hear an answer to the reality that covetousness is a mindset, it is a set of desires, it is a set that was being experienced by people regularly before conversion. And what does 1 Corinthians 6 tell us? That repentant people find hope in Christ. And the key question is, are we talking about repentant individuals? And if we can't identify what needs to be repented of, what happens to the message of the gospel? We know that those individuals in Corinth who had once experienced idolatry and homosexuality, and we didn't get into whether uh, Greg believes that Malakoi is relevant to that or is it something else, or they had experienced uh, covetousness and greediness and swindling, that, that had been their lifestyle. It was no longer. We know that central to that was a repentance from all of those things. There is hope for anyone. Greg just mentioned when someone's, if someone asks a question, would Jesus have anything for me? Jesus is a perfect savior to every single repentant person that has ever turned to him. But that one term is the one term that's become very unpopular in our day. We don't talk about repentance any longer. We talk about accepting me as I am. Repentance is a change of heart and mind and direction, and that may involve a change in what I desire, a change in what I find to be attractive. And that's what I meant by inculcating and developing disciplines where I choose to desire what God has said I am to desire as his creature, not what the world says. Maybe not even what I have experienced due to whatever my life has been. That's what taking up the cross is all about. That's what repentance is all about. And so if we begin with repentance and if we begin with you honor and glorify Christ by seeking to be what Christ has made you to be, he is your maker and your creator, then there is great hope in the words that we were looking at. Because I can't do that of my own. But if I am washed, if I am sanctified, if I am justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God, then I do have hope. It's not an easy hope. It's not something that just, boom, it's like that. It's all done. It's all gone. But it is the promise of the Christian faith that yes, Christ receives great sinners 
Christ redeems great sinners, but they are repentant sinners. The Spirit of God that accomplishes all that always gives the gifts of faith and repentance. So we have to know what we are repenting from. Disordered desires, dishonorable passions are to be repented of. They do not honor God. They cannot be sublimated into some means of honoring God. And so is there hope? I hope what you have heard this evening is, yes, for any person willing to submit to Christ in repentance, there is great hope, but we have to be able to define what it is that we need to repent of. And that really is the central issue this evening. I thank you for being here. God bless. And now, if could, if the uh, Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society could remove the pulpit once again for the final time. Is this the free will giving? There's a free will. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're going to allow each of our debaters to answer the question that has been directed to them, and also the other debater will have an opportunity to respond to that answer. Okay, we'll start with... I'm sorry, did you say how long? Uh, well, if you want me to put times on it, why oh, don't no, we... Oh, no, no, we'll just try to be succinct. Okay, that's cool. <clears throat> Okay, we have a question for Dr. Coles. Why do you want to remain and retain an attraction that is in opposition to God's natural order? Wouldn't you rather be conformed to his perfect will for a man and his desires? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I, again, as I said earlier, um, to me, the, the notion that over the course of my life, my experience of attraction to the same sex might dwindle, uh, sounds great. I love it, let's do it. Um, I'm in favor. Um, uh, what, what, doesn't, what doesn't strike me as an improvement and what I don't see any scriptural license for um, uh, is, is the notion that it, would be, that it would be valuable for me to sub out and an attraction for women to the attraction I currently experience toward men. Um, uh, it seems to me that if I'm going to be dealing with temptation regardless, the question is simply, okay, do I respond to that in, in singleness or in marriage? Um, and I'm deeply convinced that the example Jesus and the Apostle Paul give us, both of them single men, uh, is that Singleness is a, is a really wonderful place within which to, and I forget the exact language of the question here, a wonderful place within which to become conformed to the image of God. Um, uh, I, uh, again, as, as, I, as I think I mentioned earlier, it seems to me that the disordering of our desires um, has occurred for all of us, right? This is the argument of Romans 1 as it brings us to Romans 2. Um, the, the fact that any of us experience the capacity for sexual temptation toward people to whom we are not married is a reflection of the fall of humankind. And yes, I would like to have less of that experience and I would like the same thing for you. Um, I don't think that being married uh, instead of being single uh, would facilitate my obedience to Jesus. Um, uh, but I do think responding in marriage or in singleness. And by the way, I'm, I'm open to getting married. Like if God plopped a woman in my life and was like, here, you're attracted to her, you should marry her. I I'm down, I'm open to it. That just doesn't seem to be the direction he's currently working in. Um, uh, I, I want to be, I want to be open-handed to the ways that the, that the spirit is at work. Um, and again, I, though I disagreed with some of Dr. White's closing statement, I, I agree with his point that repentance is, is a really significant value in the Christian life and one that we often give short shrift to. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, and I would also agree with him that the question of what we're repenting of is significant. Uh, he would see within Scripture a, a license to repent from 
the capacity for the experience of sexual attraction and I don't, I don't see that in the text of scripture. That I think is, is the difference there. But I, I would affirm with this question asker, I would like to be conformed to the image of Jesus. I would like more and more to live a life of uh, sexual holiness in the context of my singleness or if the Lord should will my marriage. Though if I'm looking uh, at his work so far, that seems less likely. The question was specifically addressed um, to Dr. Cole's specific personal experience, so I'll only respond to one thing, and that is I, I, I disagree with the idea that because Paul in Romans chapter 2 turns around and says to the Jews, okay, you agreed with what I just said, but you're not living in light of it, means that what you have in Romans 1, 26 and 27 is referring to something that's no different than what everybody experiences, and therefore everybody experiences disordered sexual desire. That's taking the term disordered and redefining it. Um, the reality is the discussion of homosexuality in Romans 1 is an example. It's not put into the list of sins. It is an example of the twistedness of the creator-creation relationship that's, that so impacts the human being that it can actually change at that deep level uh, the desires and passions of an individual. And there's nothing in Romans 2 that says, and all of you have done that, and it's all equally the same. No. He's saying to the, to the Jews who would go, oh, yeah, we agree with everything you just said. Hey, no, you don't. You don't live in light of this. That has nothing to do with the example that he gives in regards to the dishonorable passions in Romans chapter 1. I, I disagree with that connection. Okay, we have a question for Dr. White. What disciplines should one employ to remove desires of same-sex attraction such that the desires wrongly ordered become rightly ordered desires? Um, pastorally, my response to that would be not so much a focus upon the negative desires, the disordered desires but upon the production of the proper desires. And that is, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So if I become truly passionate about loving God, then I'm going to love that which God himself loves. God created us in a particular fashion. And therefore, if I come in repentance to Christ, and I go, you gave yourself for me, I now want to live for you by your spirit. Help me to be disciplined in such a fashion as to live in my disciplines, in my actions, in what I do, in a way that will be pleasing to you. Then you go to his word and what has God revealed in regards to my creation, why he's made me, what's good, what's positive. And we haven't had time to deal with this this evening because it's, it's only ancillary. But I would simply say that one of the most beautiful things about God's creation of mankind is the male-female relationship, the family, the creation of life, and the passing on of a godly heritage down from generation to generation. And I have loved seeing the young people. There have been a few young people that have made a little noise in the room. I never even hear it. I go to apologia. <laughs> if you want to hear, if you want to hear child noise, uh, I'm not sure what the average number of kids in our church is, but it's got to be at least six. Uh, we, we've got a few 11s uh, in there, so uh, it's it's beautiful to see and to hear. And so, becoming passionate about fulfilling God's creation mandate in that way, it's that positive movement toward holiness and fulfillment that I think is much more uh, long-term effective than just simply focusing upon the negatives. The negatives need to be dealt with at the beginning because that's how you define repentance. But positively and pastorally, it's focusing upon what God has revealed he wants us to be in his creation and in living in his world. Uh, um, yeah, yeah uh, 
two, two very brief thoughts. One is I would say the notion, I, I completely, I love the pastoral vision of encourage people to love God well, 100%, I'm here for it. Uh, my concern is that uh, there were a number of decades particularly where people who were attracted to the same sex were told, if you love God well, that will cause you to stop being attracted to the same sex and start being attracted to the opposite sex. And if that doesn't happen for you, it means that you weren't loving God well enough. Um, I think the fruit of that particular messaging has been devastating. Uh, and again, I, I would uh, encourage you to read the book Still Time to Care in that regard. Um, uh, but I, I would caution us of making promises like that that, that Scripture does not make. Um, uh, moreover, as to, the, as to the question of whether moving people toward the direction of marriage, I agree that God loves marriage. I absolutely adore that. Um, and also, I agree with the Jesus who said in Matthew 19, um, when the disciples said, if that's the case, it's better not to marry. Jesus said, well, not everyone can accept that word, but only the ones to whom it has been given. Uh, for there are some who are born eunuchs, some who are made eunuchs by others, and some who, in the NIV translation, have chosen to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, um, or in the Greek, who have anuhidzoed themselves. Um, and Jesus concludes, the one who can accept it should accept it. Um, I love marriage, and I also think that Jesus has a really high view of the singleness that he himself chose. Okay, now a question for Dr. Coles. You stated that you do not think Paul stated in Romans 1 that there is a specific hierarchy to twisted desires. However, God did not destroy entire cities because they were filled and consumed with covetousness. Why do you not consider the severity of the, of the sin in light of what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, um, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, and there's a, there's a robust and intriguing scholarly conversation around uh, what precisely uh, uh, the logic behind the destruction of Sodom was. Um, we probably don't have time to get into it in great depth here. I sort of wish we could back and forth on it, but alas. Um, I will offer some thoughts, and then Dr. White will, I'm sure, offer some other thoughts that may have some difference. Um, uh, but it, it seems to me notable, uh, among other things, uh, Ezekiel lists as the system, uh, the sin of, uh, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She was overfed and arrogant. She did not help the poor and needy. So I would actually challenge the, the question asker there with respect to, I think covetousness was the example that was given. Um, uh, it seems to me, is that correct, Chris? Say that again. Did the questioner ask about covetousness not being the sin that destroyed Sodom? Was that correct? Basically, the questioner is asserting that that was not the reason that God destroyed cities. Covetousness, and, and yeah. And obviously implying that homosexuality was the reason. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so, so I would say insofar as we take Ezekiel seriously, um, that the sin of your sister Sodom was that she was overfed and arrogant. She did not help the poor and needy. Of course, Ezekiel goes on to say uh, she did detestable things before me. Um, and uh, I, I, think, I, think there's, I think there's room for us to consider the possibility. I don't consider it the, the best of the textual possibilities, but to consider the possibility um, that Ezekiel also has same-sex sexual behavior in mind. However, contrary to what the question asker says, it does in fact seem that if we understand covetousness as being broadly related to things like um, being overfed, arrogant, and not helping the poor and needy, that that was precisely what God destroyed a city for. Um, furthermore, uh, as it relates to the detestable things, specifically what practices are in mind, is it same-sex sexual behavior? Um, I would want to note a couple things. Uh, one is uh, that the, the sexual activity described uh, in that Genesis narrative um, is attempted gang rape of angels. Um, uh, moreover, um, the, there's, there's good reason to think that what's going on there is not specifically that those men were really eager to have sex with men because the proposal that Lot makes in return is, hey, do you want to sleep with my daughters instead? As if that's sort of a, a sensible exchange. Um, and so the idea of gang rape 
um, which uh, many uh, sociologists have suggested to us that gang rape is often less about sexual attraction than it is about a demonstration of power, about lording it over people. Um, it seems to me that though if the angels had been human men and the men of Sodom had had sexual intercourse with them, that would indeed have been a toeva. Um, there may also be some other toevas, some other abominations going on in that text. Um, and I think we actually see that uh, reiterated in the book of Jude, uh, where uh, Sodom is referenced, um, uh, and it says, uh, they went after strange flesh, um, which is sometimes uh, taken as Jude saying that the people of Sodom were pursuing same-sex sexual behavior. However, that word for, that's sometimes translated strange is actually the word heteros, the word for other. Um, it seems to me if Paul were concerned, or I'm sorry, if, if uh, Jude were concerned specifically with same-sex sexual behavior, it might have made more sense uh, to talk about sarkos homos, uh, the, the same flesh, um, or to, to name sexual behavior, I, I'm more inclined to think that a better reading of Sarkas Heteros, uh, other flesh, um, is that they were actually seeking to have sex with angels. Um, uh, be that as it may, I think there's a complicated, complicated history of interpretation to what precisely is going on in Sodom, and Dr. White will now solve it for us. <laughs> um, I included a chapter, I wrote the chapter in the same-sex controversy on Genesis 18 and 19, walked through it very carefully and went back into chapter 18, provided the context very briefly in regards to Ezekiel's use. Um, it's amazing how many pro-homosexual books will only quote verse 49 from Ezekiel and not verse 50, which specifically says, and they committed toeva. There's only one sexual sin that's specifically identified as toeva in the Holiness Code, and that is homosexuality. Um, and this, uh, that's when he says, that's why I took them away, specifically. No one is suggesting that the uh, people of Sodom had not engaged in all sorts of other sins. Um, we are told that Lot's soul was oppressed each and every day by the behavior he saw. But the specifics in Genesis chapter 19, uh, Lot's concern for these men, his taking them into the house, uh, there's no evidence in Genesis 19 that they know these are angels at all. They are men that have come Lot is hiding them, and when Lot identifies their action as evil, that's when they turn on him, and that's when they uh, attack. And the amazing thing is, even when they're struck blind, they don't stop. They don't stop. So the idea of gang rape is, well, there were so many people, how else could it be? Uh, but the reality is, it was that sexual desire that was there. Now, I don't think that's necessarily uh, the best argument to say, well, God, destroy, God destroyed a lot of cities for a lot of different reasons. And, it, and homosexuality wasn't the only one, but I think it was very much important in regards to Sodom and Gomorrah. The point is that there was judgment and that homosexuality is not a morally neutral idea. It's not a morally neutral thing. And so when we talk about, again, let me bring this back to the issue of the debate. What do we have to, what, what needs to be repented of? And that's why I asked the question, do you, do you believe that that's something that needs to be repented of? Well, if it's actions, if it's actually acting upon it, yes. But the desire, no. And I think that that distinction is not a distinction that can stand up to, and the questioner was asking this, the example of covetousness. And there's a number of others that we could have utilized that just happened to be in the same list in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that the desire and the act, it's, it's, it's better to have the desire and not do the act, obviously. You know, if, if you are angry with your brother, uh, but you don't kill him, that's better than both being angry and killing him. But there is still something to be repented of, of the anger. Isn't that what Jesus taught? If you say raka to your brother, as long as you don't kill him, it's okay? No, Jesus says, no, it's not okay. There is something to be repented of. That's really the issue. Is there something to be repented of here? The next question is for Dr. White. You have referred to side A and side B. Could you please define and describe what that means? Uh, well, the, the basic distinction, and, and again, as I mentioned, there's, there's there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of give and take, but the basic distinction is that side B is going to say that marriage is between a man and a woman 
and that sexual activity is to be limited to uh, marriage and the relationship between a man and woman, and therefore that would lead to uh, a commitment to uh, not engage in same-sex behavior and hence a, a lifelong celibacy, while side A uh, is, would simply reject uh, those categories and would say that homosexuality is not prohibited uh, by scripture and that they, therefore you have the affirmation of same-sex marriage and, and uh, uh, homosexual relationships. Would you want to add something uh, to that? Just sure, to yeah, just two things that, that yeah, overall, um, concur. Uh, two things I would I mean, add. I don't, know, One I, don't even, is, I don't know how long that language has existed. Do you? Uh, early 90s, I believe, is where it originated. There was a chat room because so many good things have come to us from internet chat rooms in right. the 90s. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, I, wait a minute. The early 90s, there weren't internet chat rooms. There was Fidonet BBSs. <laughs> You're too young to know I, that. I, I, was, I was not thinking deeply about these things in the early 90s, That's I regret right. okay. to inform you. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, I believe it was the early 90s, uh, there was a group that was seeking to facilitate conversation that originally came up with those terms. So relatively recent language. Um, and the way they got there was that they were, they were trying to find neutral language because they felt like uh, they felt like everybody who picked language on one side, it made the other side sound bad. It's kind of like the, like the pro-life, pro-choice debate where people feel like, well, we want to call you anti-choice. Well, we want to call you anti-life, you know? So, um, so in, in the search for language that everybody could agree on, I think they landed on those terms. The two just brief things I would add, one is uh, just to be clear on the, the side B view on sexual ethics, that would include uh, lust as well as physical sexual behavior. So lest that distinction get washed over. There's, there's nobody in side B world, um, to my knowledge, who's saying like, as long as you're not actively having sex, your brain can do whatever it wants. Um, uh, I think every, everybody would agree that, that lust uh, uh, is taught against in scripture, whether it's opposite sex lust or same sex lust. Um, uh, and then the other clarification I would want to note is in, in what is broadly called side B, um, not everybody's uh, necessarily going to be uh, celibate or to anticipate lifelong singleness. Um, many are, um, and typically uh, that's folks who find, as I described earlier, having very little attraction to the opposite sex, um, right? What Alfred Kinsey would have called a Kinsey six, though that again may be problematic terminology in various ways. Um, but the, the idea of somebody who's only entirely attracted to the same sex and not at all to the opposite sex, those people would typically uh, choose to be single. But there are also within that era of people, um, folks who uh, also choose to be in an opposite sex marriage. Uh, in some cases, because they have, have an experience more like what you would call, what some people would call bisexuality, where they experience attraction to both sexes. Or in some cases, uh, I've got some friends who are almost exclusively attracted to the same sex, but for whom God sort of put a, a single woman or man in their life and they were like, oh, but I'm attracted to that person. I could marry that person. Um, so those folks are also uh, part of that community as well. Yeah. Dr. Coles, is there a difference between quote, quote, gay Christian and quote, quote, child attracted or trans Christian? Can I be the latter two? If not, why not? Oh, um, is, is, there, is there a difference? Yes, there are so many differences. Um, uh, again, I made reference earlier to uh, the, the gender conversation and how I think it's really importantly different uh, than the sexuality uh, question. As to people who uh, find themselves uh, attracted to minors, um, which uh, I, I know there are some people who experience that. And uh, I have deep concern for the notion that we conflate that conversation with the conversation about attraction to the same sex um, because they're importantly different. The research suggests to us that they're very different conversations. Um, in all three of those cases, I would really want to know what somebody meant when they said that thing. So if, if you're saying you're trans, what are you trying to communicate to me by that term? I, I uh, have a friend, for instance, um, who uh, has, since she was a little girl, um, has experienced a visceral uh, discomfort in, dislike of her embodied sex. Um, and so for a period of time, 
um, was uh, uh, considering pursuing uh, uh, sex reassignment surgery, uh, taking hormones, that sort of thing, started identifying with different pronouns, um, had an encounter with Jesus uh, and came to the conclusion, you know what, Jesus is asking me to return to using uh, she, her pronouns. I'm not going to do anything medically to alter my body. Uh, and uh, she continues to experience um, what psychologists call gender dysphoria, uh, this, this sense of uh, visceral discomfort in her embodied sex. Um, she, she would use the word trans to describe that experience. Um, which is a very different use of the word trans than, for instance, someone who has uh, chosen to uh, hormonally or surgically transition, somebody who is currently aligned with uh, different pronouns, uh, forms of what's called social transition. Those are very, very different conversations. Um, and so uh, I, I would wanna ask a lot of follow-up questions. Hey, help me understand what, what you mean by that word, um, because uh, as, as the Princess Bride has taught us, sometimes that word does not mean what you think it means. And Dr. White. From a biblical perspective, um, there are two categories there. The concept of transgenderism, it's one thing to recognize that there's a very small number of people that experience what's called gender dysphoria. The rapid onset gender dysphoria that has been completely dependent upon TikTok and Facebook and YouTube uh, is, a, is a cultural disease that is specifically targeted to destroy our young men and women um, and is uh, absolutely, and I say this without blushing, demonic. It is destructive and demonic. It is opposed to everything Jesus taught. I was on uh, the Dr. Drew show on CNN uh, a number of years ago. Some of you may have seen it. And uh, one of the sidekicks of Dr. Drew, uh, I had pointed out that Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 said, from the beginning, God made the male and female. And he said, well, that's just one religious leader. And my response to him was, well, when you predict your own death, you die or buried, ra ro you rise again the third day and ascend into heaven, then we'll be concerned about your opinion on these things. Till then, Jesus rules. And so on that issue, the idea of using hormone blockers and everything else on eight-year-olds, uh, that, that's not even an issue for a conversation. But the real issue here is the reason you don't call yourself a trans Christian is because you have the word Christ in Christian. That's Jesus Christ. He's the one who taught that God made us in this way. And if I'm going to follow him in repentance, then I'm going to follow his ways and I'm not gonna identify myself in such a fashion as to be rebellious against him. And that is relevant to disordered desire. That's, that's been, been my concern from, from the beginning here uh, on all of these topics is who gets, by what standard? By what standard? And if Christ is who he claimed to be, he's given us that standard. Dr. White, the question for you is, isn't the primary difference over this debate that heterosexual lust is an abuse of a gift from God because a sexual attraction to the opposite sex very often leads to marriage and procreation, where as a homosexual desire or attraction can never be viewed as a gift from God. And when and at what point would you tell someone to question their salvation if they were so consumed with their lust or attraction to the same sex, even though they professed Christ? Two questions there. The answer to the first is yes. I was going to go yes and move on. But then the second part was at what point? Um, and I, I'm concerned about at what point questions simply because it's assuming that there is some type of relationship that already exists for you to be able to determine the clarity with which a person has been instructed from scripture um, and, and observe their life and, and things like that. And so um, I can't answer the second part because that would, any, any pastor in the room knows that we have been in situations where you started someplace where you thought, oh man, this is never gonna go anywhere and we're never gonna, this is, this is gonna require a miracle and lo and behold, it happened. 
Um, or in other situations, we thought, oh, I think we've got this one good, and then everything, the wheels fell off. Pastoral counseling is not something that you can give quick answers to at the end of a debate uh, and, and, and have anything meaningful come out of that. But I do have to say, yes, there has to come a point where if someone demonstrates for an extended period of time, um, I, I accept this and I, I, I see no reason for repentance at all, um, then you, you, you have to at some point be able to say, here's what scripture says, this is what you're doing, what are you going to do with that? I think you have to be able to go there. And Dr. Cole? Yeah, uh, since, since we talked about the, the significance of naming the, the location of repentance, um, and again, there, there seems to be you know, some, some difference between Dr. White and myself in where we would locate that, I suppose I would just note, I think that means uh, by Dr. White's conception that I would be no longer Christian. Um, I didn't say that. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm not at that point yet. Um, I would say because I don't see within the text of scripture uh, a, a command for me to repent of a capacity to experience a certain kind of sexual temptation, because I don't buy Dr. White's argument that Romans 1 has in mind uh, a sort of uh, pre-lustful vision of sexual orientation, because of our difference on those things, if, you're, if the argument is Greg doesn't see those things as needing repentance, therefore Greg has not repented, therefore it's time to have a question about whether or not Greg is a Christian, since I think that's looks, precisely the que conversation we're this having. this looks like the last question with, with 121. Yes, okay. Could we, could we, hold on, hold on. Could we, could I throw something in here? Because you, you, you looked at me and said, that would mean you're saying this. Sure, yeah, and I don't want to so, put words so in your mouth. So, to be, so sure. let's, let, let, let's, let's use this as, I think, an important way of, of wrapping things up. Um, if you were a part of my church, I could not have you in leadership. Hmm. Because, and, and partly because of the continued use of language that I'm not sure is... Um, allowing us to really get to the heart of the matter, and that is a capacity for temptation, hmm. okay? So I, but that does not mean that you would just automatically be, uh, you're, you're out, we're, 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 you're, we're done with you. I would deal with you as a Christian, and I would seek to patiently engage in these things, and we get into the text much more deeply than, than here, and if we were in a church together, then you would already have been made a, made a commitment to the form of exegesis and hermeneutics that would mark that particular fellowship. And I'd say, okay, let's make application. Mm. So that's a different, I think that's a different thing. Sure, yeah. But I, but I would say directly, straight up front, I would say I, I do not see any possibility for uh, being in leadership given the position that you're taking on these, these particular subjects. Mm. And I would want to pursue everything that you were just listing. So I hope that helps you understand where I would be coming from and, and in answer to the question as well. Yeah, thanks, fruitful clarification. And though I don't think we'll have the privilege of sharing a church, local church community together, I look forward to eternity with you. So cheers to that. Well, we are out of time. And uh, by the way, I am converting to Pentecostalism because a miracle occurred tonight. Every one of these cards was legible. It's the first time ever. And I'm sorry that we had so many that we didn't have time to read. A whole room full of homeschoolers. What did you expect? <laughs> but uh, I want to thank all of you also for being so well behaved. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, both of our debaters. I want to thank uh, Joel Saint and everybody at Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society, not only for putting this event on, uh, but by honoring me with this key role as moderator, I thank you from the depths of my heart for including me in this and allowing me to arrange this debate. And I just thank God, obviously, uh, most of all, that I was able to successfully arrange this debate. And I hope to see you all at a, a future event of Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society or one that I'm having, including the pastor's luncheon, if you're a man and uh, any other event that I may be having.